So here we are at Mark Johnson's flooring, the Hardy Pole, York Road. Now he's very kindly sponsored the episode today, so let's take a look around, eh? High quality florins in various colours, shapes and sizes at affordable prices. So what are you waiting for? Get yourself down. Local people supporting local businesses. So if you do end up coming down Mark Johnson's Florin on York Road and Hartley Cold, come in, use the code Davy Robson Podcast and you will get a discount. Yeah. So Doug, since yeah. we mentioned prison a few times yeah. now, we haven't even got just <laughs> as a part of how we got there, what happened. So we were going yeah. to that. So it's okay. 1983, I think. Yeah. Doug, you met up with a family from Los Angeles, I think. That's how it all started. Well, it's... Yeah, yes and no. What it is is that Martha, the woman I thought was my mom, she'd had been married a couple of times and had three daughters from different relationships. Um, but... Um, she kept giving the kids, oh, basically two of the girls got adopted. One got given back to her father. Yeah. So Martha didn't keep them. Um, the one that got given back to her father, I happened to run into years later, though I was there when they were born. I knew the, I knew who they were from when they were born, but then they would go away, right? And uh, Martha only kept me, which is always that kind of thing. But people say, oh, well, you were the boy, you know, that type of thing. Um, but uh, the one girl... Um, her dad died under mysterious circumstances and his brother took over caring for her. And these are the ones that I met. And funny enough, you know, um, basically I met them through a setup that Dr. Wetmore had actually put into place. Dr. Wetmore again. Yeah. Oh, Dr. Wetmore plays plays a big part all the way through. So uh, anyway, this man, um, John Kearns, was the guy that, Dr. Wetmore names in his Aff of Davis as being the guy he paid money to to take this other boy back to the agency. We don't know what agency that was supposed to be. That boy was born in Phoenix, Arizona, but it was supposed to be a private adoption and all this stuff like that. 
But anyway, Spoldy paid Martha and this man to take, because Martha didn't drive, this guy did. But he even made a comment in the statement that when he met the guy, the guy had a shady look about him. Oh. Yeah, you know, which, right. which is, of course, that's who you're going to give a child to and, and pay to take away, right? Because yeah. the guy's got a shady look about him. Yeah. You know? But anyway, um, circumstances came that I happened to get told about some bike parts that were for sale down there and they happened to be what I was riding which was a big Harley flathead big twin flathead and they're hard parts to find by so I'm always looking for and this guy supposedly had some down there so I went down I got these parts and then I went to this little restaurant right there and while I was in there this girl was sitting with some other girls in there and she starts talking and she makes a comment you know that clicks to me and then we talk and then come to find out she's the little girl the youngest girl of Martha and then I meet John who was the brother right. of of Daniel her father but I knew John because at one time when Martha was married to Daniel she picked me up took me to LA but John would get drunk and then he would uh, go ballistic and he would he would hit his brother and he would hit Martha so one day I went and I emptied all of his whiskey bottles out, you know, yeah, right. and uh, yeah. he found out. And so basically he chased me out of the house with a belt in his hand. Uh, and he had a big, heavy buckle on it and he was trying to hit me with it. And uh, basically he did hit me a few times. I fell down and then Martha threw herself over me. And I was probably about six, seven years old or whatever, you know, um, to protect me. Following day, Daniel put me on a bus back to Grandma Toby, you know. And uh, that was last time. But I, but the guy was such, I knew him for about two weeks and he was ingrained in my mind. Yeah. So when I saw him later, I knew exactly who he was. Right. You know? yeah. But at the same time, he also knew I wasn't John Wetmore because he took John Wetmore away. So he knew this, he knew the secrets and stuff. Well, anyway, they came up. The girl had a son. It was later to come out that that son was basically his son through an ancestral, ancestral rape of her. Right. But he had assaulted her and he had choked the little boy when the boy was only like two years old. And she got he got arrested. Well, while he's in the county jail, he gets OR'd after a couple of weeks. And that's your own recognizance. means you get released without having to pay with bail or anything. Right. Well, in California, the only way you get to do that, if you're living somewhere... You have to meet so many points on a probation officer's yeah. thing. You have to have so much residential time in the area. You have to have job references. You have to have personal references. You have to have money support. You have to have all the... He'd only been there six months. He didn't meet any of the requirements. But the probation officer who signed off to release him lived four houses down from us and was good friends with Dr. Wetmore. You know? So... It's believed that what he, it's 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 it's, it's believed. It's, we can't prove it, but it's believed that he called Wetmore basically and said, "Look, if you don't get me out of here, I will tell him what happened to the other boy and put you in it." But while he was in there, before he actually got released, the girl had come to my wife, and the girl couldn't see him in the jail because she had there was a restraining order she had put out on him, so the jail wouldn't even let her go down to visit. So she gives my wife a bottle of asthma capsules the guy had been prescribed because he had periodic asthma attacks. Yeah. And I told my wife to take it to him. So my wife took it to the jail. Now, you may think everybody would know this, but not everybody does know this, that you can't just go to a jail and tell the guard, oh, I've got this, these medications for him. Yeah. Hey, would you give them to him? And they'll just give them to him. It doesn't happen. Yeah. But people think they can. Well, my son, my son needs you know, his insulin. Yeah, no, it doesn't happen. Besides, insulin isn't brown. <laughs> you have yeah, this type of thing, right? But my wife and the guy, they wouldn't let her take it, so she took it back home. Now, I didn't know about this at the time, but what ended up happening, he gets the OR release. I had told my wife previously, after he got arrested, if he ever comes around here, don't let him in. Tell him go away. Because he and I had had physical altercations. There were a couple times he pulled knives on me, I put him in a chokehold and took it away from him. Right. But the cops would get called. But by the time they get there, it was over and done with. And because they didn't see it, they couldn't make an arrest if we didn't press charges. Yeah. And I didn't press charge on me. He didn't press charge on me. End of story. But they made the notation that they'd been called out 
for altercations yeah, between us. So it's on record. So, it's on, it's on, yeah, it's on record. So anyway, I'm, I, I have my bike shop, but I used to pick up extra money helping a few friends that did building trade. I had a friend of mine that was glazing and putting windows and stuff in. So I went out and helped him do some stuff. And I come back, and it's like 11 o'clock at night. And the first red flag for me is my wife's car is not there. 11 o'clock at night, we've got a young son. Wife's car is not there. So I, I go in the house, and as soon as I turn the living room light on, I've got a dead man on my floor. He's laid out on my floor. He's good. There's a gun on the on the the uh, the table, the you know, and there's a bottle of whiskey there. But he's laid out right where the from the where the set he is and the table. He's down between them. Well, having been a corpsman, I checked him. He's dead. No injuries. Right? No injury. I can't find a single mark on him. But he's got a gun there. My thought is he's probably waiting for me. Okay. And probably not to do me kind. Yeah. I'm thinking he had a heart attack because he drank like a fucking fish and he smoked like a fish, you know, like a you know, train and stuff. But my thought is I can't call the police because I have I have a history with, with fighting with this guy. Yeah. yeah, it's on the record. So automatically I'm going to jail. That's my first thought. I'm going to jail. Self-preservation. He's at my house. My wife and kid aren't here. So I'm thinking she's at a friend's house. She doesn't know about this. So I definitely want to get this out before my wife and kid come back. So I take him out. I put a sleeping bag. I get him in a sleeping bag. I load him in the back of my truck. I, I put his pistol back in his holster. He had a shoulder holster. I put it in. I wipe my hands off it. And there's no prints of mine. You know, I empty his, take the whiskey bottle, empty it down, and I chuck it over a neighbor's fence view, place down, again, wiped clean. Yeah. I'm just getting ready to start the truck up, and uh, my wife pulls in, and she jumps out, and she goes, oh, good, you're here, you're here, you're here. And I go, "Where? where's the boy? And she goes, oh, I took him over to his friend's house. I've been over there for a while. I said, what happened? She goes, you found him. I said, yeah. <laughs> she goes, I don't know. He came over. He frightened me. I let him in. I fixed him a dinner. I fixed him a chicken dinner. She describes it. Chicken dinner, corn, mashed potatoes. And she goes, and he sat down, and I remembered I had his medication, so I gave it to him. And he's drinking, and he's eating, and he took one of his pills. And then just as he started to stand up, he fell down. And she goes, and I didn't know what to do. And she goes, but I didn't want to call anybody because you told me not to have him over here. And, and I didn't want you to get mad at me if, you know, if you found he was here. And she goes, but I, I, I just, I've panicked. I took the boy and I took one over to my friend's house to talk to her about it. And she said, don't worry. When he comes home, he'll, he'll take care of it. So I come, you know, so I'm going, okay. So she goes, what are we going to do? I said, well, I've got to move him away from the house. That's get save my, keep my family out of harm's way. So, so I'm driving and then she jumps, had jumped in the truck and we're going. And for four and a half hours, she's harping in my ear. What are you going to do? Where are we going to bury the body? How are you going to hide this? What I, you didn't bring a shovel? What, are you stupid? You didn't. You know, oh, and it's my. on. And 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 my mind is running hundred mile a minute because I don't know what to do. I this is not something I had planned, so I have no plan. It's not that everything yeah, carries. Yeah, and and, yeah. and the thing and and I'm, and I'm she's going. You know, I I know I shouldn't have let him in, but it's your fault for not being there to to tell you know make sure he couldn't come in. I said, I was working. She was, yeah, but you didn't have to work. That was something extra. And, I, and she's yelling at me for me being stupid, for not having all this worked out. Oh, and we're And so by the time we actually started driving, it was probably about 12. Well, now it's like four or something in the morning, and false dawn is just starting to show. You know, a few hours driving. We have over four and a half hours. We're driving, but just false dawn. And we're out in the countryside where farm workers start early. And all I know is I can't be found driving around a truck with this dead man in my tr- in my back. Yes, yeah. Can't be. It makes it even look, you know. So, so I pull over to the side on this one road. It's, and it's a reasonably main road. It's a paved road. I pull over. I take him out. And I sit him up against a fence post where there's like this, or, uh, this vineyard thing, right? And then I do what everybody says was the stupidest thing I could do. I take a piece of paper and a pencil. And I write in case of emergency, call this call this number and I gave it, left my name and phone number. Oh, and no. I put it in his wallet. 
right? But the idea was... Who said that was stupid? He, huh? Who said that was stupid? Just about everybody. I fucking did. But see, the thing was... <laughs> see, the, pro- was the thing is that he didn't have any identification in his wallet because he right. just got out of the jail. I know it may sound really crazy, but I wanted him to be buried and, and you know, I want, I want, yeah. I, yeah. Want him look yeah. After yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so, so in my mind, that's what I'm thinking, right? Yeah. We drive away. He's found like 30 minutes later by one of the farm trucks. They see him, see the guy sitting there. He's got the gun and all this stuff in there and like, right. And, uh, they find the thing. So they call, they call me the very next day. I'm at my bike shop. And uh, there's something in Fresno and stuff. And, uh, what was your state of mind like at this point? Or, like, well, well, the thing or? at that point in time, I don't know they found him yet. Mm-hmm. I'm just waiting. All of a sudden, the call comes in, and the guy goes, uh, do you know a John Kearns? Because when they ran his prints, it came out of the jail. Gave, they got his ID from a jail record, right. right? So they got it. And the picture matched from the intake. And I go, yeah. And he goes, when was the last time you saw him alive? I said, two weeks ago. Which was a lie. Yeah. If they'd said, when was, <laughs> when did you yeah. see him last? Well, when I dumped him off at the side of the road. <laughs> but no, they said, when did you see him last alive? Yeah. Sorry. But now they call that uh, interference with an investigation. Right. And they said I was lying because I could have been more truthful. Well, that's not lying. You know, you didn't, you got to ask the right question to get the right answers, right? I mean, this is the way I looked at it. So anyway... So they're like, well, we found him and uh, stuff like that, and he's going to be doing an autopsy. And uh, we've contacted his daughter because the girl had he, he adopted her after his brother his brother died, and uh, like I said, his his brother died in a, under kind of unseemly circumstances. We'd like to tell you another time about that, but anyway, um, so I know Sir, she got the phone with her him. She calls me. Oh God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So what, they've got him, and I said, yeah, but what happened to him? And I said, well, I don't know. Well, your wife said that he came over to the house, and, you know, and she fed him, and then she gave him his medication, and he collapsed and, and stuff. And he goes, why did he die? I said, well, I don't know. He didn't have any marks on him. I said, but they're going to do a, uh, an autopsy. She goes, they are. And then she hangs up. Doesn't even say goodbye. Just hangs up. Okay, so, I, you know, okay, this way. Now, we don't know... We don't talk. My wife and I aren't having yeah, down yeah, dinner yeah. talking about it. We just, it's like, not something we're going to talk about. But we don't say that. We just kind of like ignore it. Like, then, uh, 30 days later, uh, I come and I find uh, that my wife and the girl had been arrested. Um, and the way, the way I find this out is I go over to pick up my son at, at the girl's house because she was ba- goes to be babysitting. And I see my wife's car there. And my wife's got a little Dodge Colt, which is, yeah. it was really identifiable. I mean, it was one of those cars. It was, it was a weird little, when we got it, we used, it had a weird little shade to it that nobody else has. But I pull up and I go there and, my, and the girl's door is open. Nobody's in there. Her kid, my kid, the girls, nobody's there. My wife's car is there. This other girl is a big, heavy set girl. She don't walk. She never walks anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I'm really confused. So as I walk back across the street to my truck, I'm standing there. There's these big oriander bushes. And they start talking to me. Psh, psh, psh. I look over and I see this pair of eyes pulling the crust. He goes, the cops were here. It says, two suits in a blue sedan. And he gives me the license plate number. They got the girls. They got the kids. I went, okay. And he goes, I didn't tell you. And he closes it. And he takes off, right? So it's like, okay. But what cops? We have city. We have county. We have state. We have federal. What cops? Right. Yeah. So, so I drive. I'm driving back to my house, and uh, I'm gonna make some phone calls because we didn't have cell phones back then. Mm-hmm. You have to go to a pay phone. You have to call from your home phone. Don't have cell phones. This is the time period, people. 
Um, so I'm driving back to my house. Well, they just put a new off ramp on the highway thing. So as I'm coming over the top of it, I look down and I see a blue sedan at the corner of my street, just parked to where they can watch the street. I know every car on my street. There is no blue sedan at my thing. Yeah. So immediately, bells will go off. Like I said, I'm a, I, I'm a biker. Yes, I'm not a criminal, but at the same time, I'm on the shadows, right? So I come down, I go and I park four blocks away and I sneak through the alleyways all the way over, get, jump over my fence, come through my back door. And I get up to the front door and I just crack it open. There's a card in the door. And it's from the sheriff's department. So I leave the card in and I close the door back. <laughs> so that way if they come up, they don't, you know. So like, okay. So my first thought is that unfortunately, because one of my club brothers was a gun runner, that he had given me a, you know, some guns that were probably not what I should have. You know, they had silencers on them and they were marked Swiss police. So, yeah. <laughs> so I took, I had this lockbox that I bought that's fireproof and all that stuff. So I quickly wrapped them up in oil skins and lots of grease and stuck them in and buried them about three feet below my bedroom. I think we had, we had a under, way to get under the house oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> Covered up, put leaves and everything over. And so I know that they're the only illegal things I had in the house. The other guns I had were all legal, not worried about. But I'm figuring I'm going to contact the sheriffs to find out what's going on. Yeah. So I take off my gun harness and leave it at the house. I get in my truck and I'm driving. And I'm getting ready to go over to a friend's house because I'm going to drop the truck off at the friend's house so they don't confiscate my truck yeah. and have him drive me down and you know, I'll go down person. And I'm going along, and as, as I'm driving down the street, I see this black-on-black -black 69 Impala pulling behind me, and it's and and it's 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 like cruising behind me. Well, if you ride with a motorcycle club, you do sometimes have people who don't always necessarily agree with you or your politics or yeah. you know things like that. And I'm thinking, great, that's just what I freaking need. Is some you know other issue coming up now? And I open the glove box, and the only thing in the glove box is a K bar knife. And I put that on the front seat of my bike, you know, my my, my truck. And I'm driving down, you know, First Street, <laughs> and this car is going. So I go, okay, I'm I'm going to check because yeah, I make a corner, it makes a corner. So I'm like, okay. So I whip down this residential neighborhood, and I come whipping around. And it jumps, and all of a sudden the back end rises up on this car, and it's chasing me. Yeah. Now I got a big 350 in my truck, which will get me going down the road. It's got a pair of four barrel carbs, so I can get some speed out of this son of a bitch. And the car starts chasing me, you know. And I go through, and we run through a red light, and I'm going down this thing. I get up to Gettysburg Avenue, take a quick left, and all I could think in my mind is, if this is going to go south, I want lots of witnesses. It's the only thing I can think in my yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. So I'm driving to an area that's a little shopping area where there's always people. There's restaurants yeah. right here. There's little shops right here. People in the parking lot. I'm, and it's right yeah, on a main, yeah, main yeah. four-way yeah. yeah. So if it goes bad, people are going to see me. I'm yeah. going to get this. I pull in, and I quickly throw the car, to the truck to the side, throw the thing up, grab the knife, jump out the door, and I run towards the car. These two guys come running out of the car. One slides across the top with a little sawed-off shotgun, and uh, the other one has a, a pistol. And uh, basically, the guy with the pistol kicks my feet out, and I fall to the ground. And the guy with the shotgun puts it in the back of my head. Joke. The rest of and then they cuff me because they are a part of the task force that deals with motorcycle clubs and street gangs and, nice. and drug nice. things. But they're undercover, so they're dressed like these things no. like... Normal, well, as normal as you want to get one. They got longer hair and beards and yeah. all that stuff. You know, so they cuffed me, right? And uh, they said, you're under arrest. That's what I'm under arrest for. So we're not going to tell you. That's not our job. Ours is just to get you in custody. They take me down the, the, the county jail. So I'm at the county jail. They put me in this one little room thing. And uh, I could hear my, my wife talking in another room. You know, so I... I put my lips down by the door and I yell, don't say anything till there's, you have a lawyer. Yeah. And they end up kicking the door and busting my lip. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, shut up. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm in there for about 12 hours in this little tiny room. 
They come and get me. They bring me inside the room. They put me in the chair. And I'm cuffed behind the chair. And uh, the cop comes in and says, uh, so uh, what, do you, what do you know about John Kern's death? I said, I don't know anything about John Kern's death. Because I don't. I don't know why I call killed him. He goes, well, we got the autopsy back, and uh, he was strangled. strangled. I go, strangled. And, and I'm thinking, they're looking at me as the only person who, one, strong enough, and two, who has the skill. He just wasn't yeah, yeah. And who has, the, who, has the, who has the skill. You know? The skill, yeah. And uh, so I'm going, well, I don't know anything about it. And then they say, well, what about the forged checks? I go, forged checks? He says, yeah, three days after he was reported dead, your wife and you know, your, your sister went out and were forging checks on his account. Your sister said she was doing it because he'd been taking her welfare money and she wanted to get her welfare money back. And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't know. He said, it said well, but you, we have these photographs. And they put the photograph out there at the bank, which they didn't have a lot of CCTV, but they did have it at the drive-up window of the bank. And they've got my truck that they used. And they had admitted that they had put petrol in my truck, which now made me an accessory because I got monetary gain. Yeah. So... Anyway, so walking a fucking hard place. So, so anyway, so so I'm sitting in there and they're going, well. So are you a tough guy? And I said, no, I'm not a tough guy. It's just, well, you you fought this guy before. So we had our differences. And I said I was never arrested for it. I said that's only because we didn't get there in time. You know, and so on your you know, own. And, and they're right on this thing, right? And um, then the guy goes, but uh. If you wanted to strangle him, you could have strangled him, huh? So, well, I have a gun permit. If I wanted to shoot him, I could have shot him. You know, I mean, you know, and where are we going with this? You know, I have a car. I could have ran him over if I wanted to yeah, run him yeah, over. Yeah. Where are we going with this, right? And he goes, well, um, where were you on such and such a night, which was the night that before he was found dead? Because they did the, the coroner said he'd been dead this many hours. Yeah, right. I can tell you. And I said, well, that's easy enough. I said, I was at this friend of mine working. And they called him up and he said, yeah, he was there with me until 11 o'clock at night. Right. So I'm no longer there at the time he died. Now, this makes, oh, well, now my friend's lying for me. Funny enough, my friend was the son of a city council person. And of course, his dad calls and says, if my son says that's where he was, and that's where he was. Yeah. So now they're really confused because... The only other future suspects are women, right? And they're not that the women it could be pretty, you know, because yeah. this guy's, you know, uh, the, he had been a uh, steel worker or he just retired a few years earlier from being a steel worker for 25 years. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was a wimpy little guy. How old was this guy? Uh, he was at the time, he was like, I think, I don't remember, it's in the paper, but I think he was like 62. 62. Yeah. And, uh, but he was like, 190 pounds and like five foot eleven. So he's quite well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing was, when he got arrested for assaulting the girl, she the way they, that happened is he he'd been punching her in the face and he choked the do, uh, the son, but she drove him down a street and jumped out of the car and ran into a battered women's center and he got arrested. He was arrested with a sword cane, a belt buckle knife, and a 25 automatic in a wallet holster. Jesus, so, about, yeah, so, so, you know, it's not like he's, you know, some nice, kindly, but they like to point out he had a cane and he had two canes, one that carried a flask of whiskey in it and one that carried a sword in it. He didn't carry a cane because he needed a cane. Right. But and this I've got a police report when he was arrested. I've got a copy. I forgot to bring it. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. good. But I mean, so it was like this is the kind of stuff that I, you know, that we're dealing with. So anyway, they. <sighs> It, they're they're trying to figure out where all this come down to. But anyway, so we're sitting in there, and uh, they do the tests on the checks. My fingerprints aren't on the checks. My handwriting doesn't match the checks. Yeah, they're not made out to me. They're made out to the girl, and she admits. Her check, she wrote the check, she signed the check, she endorsed the check, she posted, she cashed the check, 
It was all that. Because the checks were at her house because that's where he'd been living before he got arrested. Right. So she had access to him. Okay. Yeah. So then they tell her, um, well, we're going to... Um, Char we're going to um, charge you for forgery and all the stuff and you're facing 18 years and she's whoa 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 have I got a deal for you his wife poisoned the man poisoned him said the capsules that she gave him had cyanide poison in them and she poisoned him what the fuck so, uh, so the, was it and oh, so they go wait a minute what so they go and redo the autopsy and the second autopsy comes back and says cyanide poisoning jeez right which gives you the same coloration of being strangled. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So now she becomes the state witness to get rid of all of her charges, get a full immunity to testify against my wife. My wife gave. Now they have a record of my wife going to the jail, trying to give these capsules to him. Yeah. All right. But now my wife gave them to him at the house. Oh, fucking hell. Oh, man. But they don't know where the capsules are because they're nowhere to be found. They're not on his body. They're not at my house. Don't know what happened to those. I never saw them. So I don't know anything about this. But now they come back with this. And then, of course, because my wife was involved in the forgery stuff, that's monetary gain. So my wife's facing murder one with special, two counts of special circumstance, which count for the death penalty. Right? In the meantime, what they do with me is they keep bouncing my charges around, uh, changing, okay, now it's now it's conspiracy to this, now it's accessory to that, and stuff. But at the same time, they've made it to where my bail is is half a million dollars. And I can't make a half a million dollar bail. Even though it's supposed to be reasonable, I can't make it. <clears throat> the girl goes in and she, she testifies. We have a newspaper article where she admits that she actually lied in court about some of the stuff she was saying. But they let her keep her immunity, and they still run the trial. <clears throat> they run my wife's trial in December of 83. <clears throat> they get a hung jury. They get a hung jury. One man cannot bring himself to sign off on a woman being put to death. Right. But he says, if he only wanted to put her in prison for the rest of her life and let her die naturally, I could go with that. But the other 11 jurors were all willing to put my wife to death. Okay. okay. So I get called in in February of 84. The DA comes in. He's just lost the other one by that one little glitch. All right. He's going to rerun the case. He comes in. My wife's lawyer sitting there. My lawyer sitting here. Me here. DA's here. DA says, here's the deal. I'm going to make you a one-time and one-time offer only. And you've got 15 minutes to make a decision. He goes, if you don't take this deal, I will run your wife's trial again. I will make sure the next jury doesn't have that little wiggle in it. I will get her sentenced to death. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. He goes, because yeah, I've got two counts. I can, I'm sure I'm going to get it. He goes, so here's the deal. You are the head of the household, but you don't seem to know anything goes on in your household. Is that true? So, yeah. Yeah, well, you got 12 minutes to make this decision. Um, so, I'm going to offer you a chance to take the time off your wife. You'll get, you'll serve 13 years as long as you do good time and work time in yeah. prison. If not, it doubles up and you have the L on it. You know, so, you know, he goes, now you have 10 minutes to make this decision. Now, I will release your wife, drop all charges. Now, think about this for a minute. She's being faced with a death penalty, but they're willing to drop all those charges. Except the child. Right, the right. right. But, but they're willing to do this if I'm willing to take responsibilities negligent of the head of the household. Okay. So they said, so ask yourself, how would you explain to your son that you, you had a chance to save his mother's life and chose not to do it? Oh, you got nine minutes left. Oh, uh, so who do you think could uh, better do time in prison? You, the biker, vet, blah, 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 or the woman who's just a part-time worker at a mini mark and stuff? Oh, you got five minutes left. Now, 
Are you really a strong, tough guy? Or are you really just putting on the show here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got 90 seconds left. They're probably grilling you. In, in, like, in, in 60 seconds, I walk out of this room. So, so what's your decision? Because once I walk out of this room, there's no deal. There's no and option, my wife, so my lawyer, my lawyer says, not going to get a better deal. And he goes, and just to add the sugar to it, I will not ever oppose any parole for you. So I took the deal. So the sentence, it was 27 to life, but based on the fact that I was only going to do 13 if I stayed out of trouble and stuff. Okay, so, so 13 is what I was told I was going to do. So I'm focused on 13. Mm -hmm. So I end up uh, basically uh, going in, and uh, it was really funny because the, the judge goes, uh, so did you, did you kill Mr. Kearns? He says, no. Did you poison Mr. Kearns? No. And it was like, uh, hmm, uh, hmm. And the probation officer's report that they did, they had listed, they were wanting, they, they were asking that the judge sentence me to actually a total of six years and somebody named John Wesley Kearns to, 20, to 27 years of life. That's the only place that name ever shows up. We have no idea who this John Wesley Kearns was. We have no idea. The guy who died was named John Kearns, but Wesley wasn't his middle name. So we have no idea. But that gets overlooked. Oh, oh it's just a typo. We, we're not going to worry about that. Mm. And as it has been said by a few people who've commented previously, the, the, the courts, the, pro, the district attorneys, all that stuff, don't have to uh, get everything right. Mm -hmm. It's not up to them to, to, to get everything right. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, no. But there's been people who've said that you don't have to get things right. You know, and they don't have the time every time in the day. And that, you know, to, to do, to redo the research, to make, to, to get, you know, check everything. So the facts don't have to be there as long as they get the conviction in the end. Right. And there's been people who've made this comment to me. Right. So anyway, uh, I get sentenced to, to the time and I actually get sent to prison on the 27th of February, which was my baptism date on the Isle of Man, which had been the birth date I had before I knew the 21st was actually my birthday because the only document I had was my baptism certificate. Mm -hmm. So I actually get sent to prison on my, my baptism crazy. date. Crazy. Yeah. That's and uh, I had just turned 30. So what was the charge? What was the whole charge? Well, it, 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 it basically was, it was the uh, conspiracy to murder, to uh, accessory to forgeries, the forgery. Yeah. They gave me all the stuff, even though they have their own documents saying, I didn't have anything to do with the checks. I didn't, you know, the closest thing to get on the accessory was the fact I got petrol and that was monetary gain that even though I didn't know I was getting it. Am I right in saying they did drop the charges on your wife, but they reinstated them when you pled guilty? They did. They ran back and they reinstated them real quickly and her that lawyer walked in with a copy of my confession, basically, and got that, all the jury found her that that it was the, the yeah, judge the judge wouldn't even let the jury hear it. no 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 you know yeah. the da you made that deal with him you can't renege on it because he was trying to get a full house basically at the last minute right but the problem was my wife having been in the county jail for like six seven months at the time um had become friends with girls that were in the jail with her and one of them introduced her to her brother and so two weeks after i got my wife out she took off with that guy oh, and, oh, uh, and yeah loud. and it never uh Heard from her again, yeah. But, you know, like I said... What about your kid? Your well, unfortunately, uh, she was with him. Uh, he was with her for a, a few years, but he started acting like me, sounding like me, walking like me, and the guy she was with didn't like that and uh, made her put him in foster care. And then not too long after that, um, he, he, he died, was killed by a drunk driver on a rainy day. Oh, sorry, sorry, so, yeah. so I have... so. Yeah, I actually have no family, but the oldest boy, like I said, he, you know, we've come to find out he was Wetmore's kid, not my kid. And uh, he's just, uh, okay, yeah, I've been, yeah. And so, and like I said, when you, when you, when you actually sit down and read Wetmore's statement, you're going to see so much more in there. You're going to go, yeah. okay, God, yeah. these people who say this can't be true. Right. Okay, you couldn't make this up for a movie. Well, but that's the Fucking thing. Bizarre. But like I said, it's not only that people say that it's not true and that it couldn't happen. 
You know, they, they also like say they sit there and go, well, you were in prison all that time. And uh, and somewhere in the record, somebody said that I'd done forgeries when I was a kid and that, you know, the funny thing is about a forgery. There's a difference between putting your name on somebody's check and cashing it and making full documents that will pass government Spe- yeah. Yo, <laughs> yo, yo, yo. You find it hard to do that on the out, never mind on the in. Yeah, you know what I mean. I mean, it's not like this is the great escape, and I'm the I'm the guy who's making all yeah. the documents to get you know to yeah. get out of Germany. I mean, you'll yeah. just you'll just never have a break. Have you yeah. six months old, yeah. and it's just been fucking stop all the way. Well, no, but my break came this year on my 68th birthday yeah, yeah. when I got my birth registered yes. on the island because that was one of those things that John people Lord. kept telling me you'll never happen it'll never happen you can't get that done they won't do it end of story you're not gonna yes. and, and and the thing was that and then the whole point was then the people who were saying oh you're born in Arizona you're born in Arizona suddenly went mute yeah yeah because now they're like whoa the yeah yeah so yeah that's you know yeah yeah I'll get letter for it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a full page article about it, you know? Yeah. And the only thing that, that they made an error with was down the statement about Man of the Isle, Son of the Sea, Brother of Storm. They kind of mis, mis- said that. But other than that, it's it's all the same, you know? Man, and then. This man shares his remarkable life story. Yeah. Margin gets bad, said we could age 68. Yeah. That's and Newcastle Chronicle also ran an article oh, after, yeah. Oh, probably. About get, it. I'll get, yeah. Get order that yeah, day. so they, they ran one as well. You know, about it, you know, and so, and like I said, and I, I've done interviews for both my books on Talk Radio Europe. Yeah. The Island Man did two little ones, and then I got called by a guy named Dave Moore, who does the commentary for the races, the TT, and right. and, the, and the 100s, and the Northern Ireland one, and stuff, and he said, I don't think the girls who interviewed you previously really understood the magnitude of your story. It's- and he did an hour interview with me, and he ran that while I was there at the TT. It's absolutely yeah. mind blowing a story. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's, you know, you, it's like, you couldn't make it up. It's impossible to make all that up. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, like, it's bizarre, isn't it? Well, oh, yeah. It's all work. You know, like. Yeah, and I mean, and. and you getting sentenced on your fucking. The day you were fucking baptized. Yeah. No, no. That was the day I actually was put on the bus to prison. What the <laughs> on the bus to prison Christ that day, Christ. yeah. <laughs> That was the day I was put on the bus. The fuck? I know we're laughing about it now, but like yes. at the time, man. Fucking yeah, I mean, to get, you know, for me, a time to get the end round. Yeah, to but like, to tell you, take it all in at once. But that's why when I talk to people, because funny enough, what what usually happens, somebody will hear my accent, yeah. and and I and like say as I t- as I was saying during the break, I I, I try to to let people know that I'm not a bitter, angry, you know, you know, no. horrible person. And, I'll, and so I joke with them at times. And one of the things I'll do, people will go, well, where's that accent from? And I said, well, I was in Primark and I went down the accent aisle and I pulled this. <laughs> I thought I'd try it out. Or the other thing is that if I've told them that my, my majority of my 90% of my ancestry come from Birmingham, uh, I'll tell them, well, it's a Brummie accent. And they go, a Brummie accent? I said, it's the same one that Ozzy Osbourne has if he was in 63 years in America. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and so I'll joke with them like this, right? And the thing is, I won't take myself so seriously. So, you know, I I, I, I can talk you know, this way, and and but I let them realize that I'm not really clowning them. I'm just pl- I'm clowning myself with this thing. Yeah. But you know, the the deal is that, uh, I'll because I'll do that, and then or if I say yeah, I'm from uh, you know, I'll go well. Where do you think I'm from? And they'll go America, and I'll go nope. Canada, nope. Where do you think I'm from? They go, I don't know. I said the Isle of Man. They go, is that an Isle of Man accent? I said, nope. I said, it's an American accent, but I'm not from America. Yeah. I just lived there for 63 and a half years. And like I say, Donald Trump deported me because I'd been illegally in his country. But you know what? The only question the immigration... For your resume, yeah. Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, the only question that I was asked by the immigration judge when I went before him, all the other guys, they always ask him, do you, you know, is this, this, this. They ask him all kinds of questions. And one thing he said to me, do you fear for your life if we return you to London? And I went, have you, have you, have you read my, my life story? Have you read my history? Do you think that there's a reason I should fear for my life? Is there something about London that I don't know that you do? I mean, you know, 
And, and the, the, yeah, I mean, that was the only question was, did I fear for my life to return to London? And, and, and I just could not. They wanted video, didn't they? Huh? They wanted you out. Oh, yeah. No, they wanted me out. And like I said, it was funny because uh, the one ice agent goes, do you realize you'll never be able to come back and go to Disneyland? And I told him, check this out. If I'm really that hard up to see a large mouse, they got one in France and they got one in Tokyo. I said, but, you know, I don't really think that's been my main yeah. focus on things. Yeah. And then they kept people kept going, you know, they're not going to like you over there because you sound like an American and we kicked their butts during the war. And I said, which war? And then they go, well, the Revolutionary War. I said, oh, you're to the colonial revolt. Mm -hmm. And then they'd get really mad. What do you mean colonial revolt? You were colonists and you revolted against King George. And then sadly enough, you guys wanted to make George Washington a king. You just got rid of one King George. Now you want to make another King George. What the hell is up with that? And he chose not to do the I'll stay president. Thank you. You know, I mean, so yeah, but this is, so like I said, but yeah, my life, like I said, it's been all that, but quite honestly, you know, um, I've been asked to, I think my wife knew that there was poison in the capsules. Yeah, I was just about to ask you that as well. Would you? I don't know for a fact she knew that. I do believe that Wetmore was the one that gave the that got the the capsules tainted and given to the girl to give to my wife. But his hands are clean because he's so far off out of because he probably didn't actually give the capsules. He just had it. He just he just had it. He just had it all because, like I said, this is a guy who worked for the OSS, which is a precursor to the CIA. Yeah, because of the CIA. And the funny thing is, if you know anything about college professors. One of the things that they're well known for is they write papers and they write books. He taught personnel management and marketing. He used to go and do meetings with like Sumitomo Bank, Bank of America, First Interstate Bank, you know, the Bank of Tokyo, things like this and stuff. He's a smart guy as well. He never wrote a book. He never published a paper. But he often helped particularly guys that were in the, in the sports, such as football, wrestling stuff, he always helped to make sure that they could graduate. And many of them, funny enough, went to work for the State Department. Was he OSS, do you think? He was. No, he, he, you know, he, he, says, he even says in his statement, he, yeah. nine years in, in the government service in Brazil, you know, he worked for the State Department. Yeah, and on, on, on shipping uh, sheets that he's been on, he, he initially goes as a student, and then he goes as an analyst. And if you ever watched that 24 series called 24, the, that one. well, yeah. that's a series. It used to be, I, 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 used to, I hated it, and I would tell people, because the idea is that somebody in America finds out there's going to be a nuclear attack in 24 hours, and it somehow can go all the way through the chain thing to get the agent to get him over there and stop it. Yeah. The U.S. government's not nearly as, as Keith, efficient as that. Keith or Sutherland was, it? Keith or Sutherland, yeah, you know, was in it. But the idea was is that he worked for the CIA and he was an analyst. Right. And if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the films like the Patriot Games and stuff, the guys who work for the CIA, they're always referred to as analysts. Right. Now, I'm not saying Wetmore was an agent, but definitely he had his fingers in pies. Yeah, he definitely connected. And like I said, right. and when, when the President of the United States is a friend of your, he, he grew, he was living one mile from Richard Nixon in LA for, from the late fifties. He was, he supported him during the, the, the 1960 elections against Kennedy. And then when he got, and he used to bitch and complain about how badly people were treating Nixon and stuff like that when they're going after him for the Watergate and all the kind of stuff. But he used to go to San Clemente, which is the Western White House thing, and he'd go to the White House. Funny enough, he always made sure that he didn't seem to be in any photos. He'd always be in behind the man behind a curtain type thing, you know. But like I said, one of the people that came on a regular basis, and the only reason I even know his name is because I've seen enough photos of him, was G. Gordon Liddy, who was one of the Watergate plumbers. The only one that really didn't tell on the president and did the most time and then came out and, like I said, got involved in you know, consulting protection stuff like Blackwater, that type of stuff. Go so, this to yeah. You know, I mean, so, you know, the, you know, like I said, but the problem is once they got me in, in your prison file, they have a confidential section. 
you can't see what's in that confidential section. There was a point at one time when the board would refer to things. Well, we've seen some stuff in uh, this confidential section. Well, I don't know what they're... My attorney's not allowed to see it. So how can I argue against something I don't know is there? Well, somebody who I knew had worked at records. They went and looked and they said, yeah, there's uh, some stuff they put in there that is impeding you getting getting out. And of course, like I said, when five years, you know, like I said, just a few years after I went in, they took away all the good time work time, which immediately doubled my sentence back to the 27 life. And then a the year later, the governor took my date. And I finally got found suitable in 2013. And the board member who found me suitable, a guy named Laban, he was the commissioner because there was just him and one other person. He finds me and he tells me, if you don't write a, your book when you get out, I will be sorely disappointed. He goes, you have a story that he goes, that he goes, you have a story that reads like a Dickens tale. He goes, you need to get this out. And he said, and he goes, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure your parole gets done. I'm going to cross T's, dot the I's, all that. And he tried to make sure. Well, the governor had the right to take dates. Now I went before Governor Brown, who was considered to be the most liberal. He'd been the governor in the 70s and gave prisoners rights like television and, and, and family visits and things like that. Well, those got taken. A lot of those had gotten taken from us over the years, but he had given them. So he's coming back in for a second term now. And everybody's saying, oh, he's going to be good for us. Right. I go before him. Two days before I'm supposed to be released from prison. He denies me. Well, when they give you a denial, it's supposed to say why. It's supposed to be a reason. It didn't have a reason. It just said governor's denial. So I file to get that so I can take it to the court and argue. Because okay. whatever it is, I'm going to argue because I had so much uh, so much programming, staying out of trouble, staff re requests, they, all the everything. And I was going to be deported already. We already knew I was going to be deported. The governor's office in his back says, because the governor can. Yeah, what the hell is that? Yeah, that's that's not a legal. He can't and he won't. Well, but the thing was, that's not a legal arg argument on his because, side. Uh, so I take it to the court. And what the court came back and said, well, it might not be the one you want. But, you know, it is his opinion. And right now, we have to honor it. What the hell is that? That's not a. That's not even a judicial you know, they, there was, opinion. I mean, I wasn't getting multi-sheet stuff. I get one line liners on a half page piece of paper, you know? So, yeah. So then I end up going, and it's in my second book. I end up going, uh, it, uh, I was given a five-year denial, basically, right? Yeah. So, so how long did you serve when you got the five-year five uh -huh. denial? How long did you serve by the time you got your five-year denial? Well, by then, it was now, now the 2000s, well, no, let's see, but... The 2000, no, I got three years now. Anyway, I got to 2000, um, and um, um, no, I got 2017. So it was like, it was five years now, and I got it down earlier, so I got it in four years. But anyway, so I go before this one board, and I walked in, and I had a lawyer with me that was actually a paid lawyer. People had put together money and got me this lawyer. And I had just been continuing doing good, doing good, doing good. Yeah, yeah. So I'm set. You, you're not going to get no me. Reason. There's no reason not to give me my yeah. date. And let me go home. <laughs> and this, these, these two women come in and sit down, that board members. <laughs> this one, the district attorney starts to make his statement. Yeah. And she basically tells him, shut up. I don't want to hear anything from you. And she tells my attorney, shut up. On her. And then she stood up and she yelled at me for two hours. I knew all about veterans. My husband was a Vietnam veteran with PTSD. You're all pieces of shit. And, I, and for two hours, she yelled at me. And I'm sitting there and I'm gripping the chair. Yeah. And the guard in the back of the room, you, you know he's like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to tackle Kane. You know, because he's expecting any moment I'm going to snap and go over the table on her. Yeah. And when she stopped... And we go out of the room. I go, thank you very much. And I walked out. Yeah. And so she gives me that denial. I file. I get called back the following year, 18. Right? Because I said this was totally un, you know, um, 
professional and it was against everything. And there happened to be that day two observers from an outside organization that called that Life that Support that Alliance. That and they, they wrote this thing up. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the officer contacted the officer's union and said, she was putting my life in danger. <laughs> he goes, if Kane had snapped, I do not know if by myself I could have controlled him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Said everybody in that room at that moment, the district attorney filed on her unprofessionalism because she told him to shut up before he ever got first word. All this, right? So the next year. So I'm going back in and I'm going back into the next hearing and I've got this Nigerian guy named Ayayi, right? And it's a lawyer. And most of the guys hated because they couldn't understand him. But I have a little trick with people. If they're trying to speak English, okay, yes. and they, their accents are hard or whatever, I don't listen to them. I watch their lips. Because yeah. even if they're saying when, no matter what, when, you know, I see when. Yeah. I can see their lips. I can read their lips. I don't listen to what they're saying. And so I actually kind of yeah, got a long things. thing with them, right? Okay, so we're sitting in there, and he walks in. He goes, well, the board's here. I said, yeah. And he goes, it's the same one you had last year. And I go, oh, no. I said, I'm not going in there. I said, I'm not going to listen to her yell at me for another two hours. I mean, it's not going to happen. He goes, no, no, you need to go in there. He goes, because boards can be different. Even the same board can have a different day, you know, yeah. and and he could. If yeah. a guy didn't didn't get a cup of coffee in the morning, or if his wife wouldn't put out, or whatever, he could be have one of these attitudes, right? And I'm like, I said, I'm gonna tell you, if she starts yelling at me, I can't. I'm not gonna say how this is gonna go because I'm not. I'm not up for it. And he goes, No, no, I, 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 we're gonna go in there together. I will stand up for you. I said, the other one couldn't do it. And I was, you know, I was paying him. You're an appointed lawyer. He goes, I will tell you, I'm from Nigeria. I have been through troubles before. I will stand up to her. You know, and I'm like, okay. I said, well, don't worry. I said, uh, I am a single cell. So if, if they end up throwing you in there, I'll let you come into my cell. You know, I tell him this, right? And so we go in there. We sit down. The DA comes in. Same DA from the year before. He's got his stuff. And they walk in and you see the DA go. All deflates. Because he didn't know who they were going to be. She comes in and uh, she turns to him and says, uh, Mr. District Attorney, have you got something you'd like to say? And he gets up and he goes, yeah. And she goes, now I want to warn you. If it's anything that you have said previously in any other hearing, I don't want to hear it. It has to be something that's never been said in this hearing before. Well, can I just say we, we oppose his parole? She goes, that's all you're going to say. Now sit down. So he sits down. She goes, Mr. Ayayi, have you got anything to say? Yes, I do. And he gets up and he starts talking about, you know, my programming, my chronos, you know, the fact that I've won awards from the cholester, cholesters up. Uh, uh, this thing over here where yeah. you know uh, I've won all kinds of awards I got a yeah. stack like that of drawings and woodworking and all I'd yeah. send them over and be judged and oh, stuff. All right, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Uh, including I've got a Saxon helmet that I carved out of a picture out of National Graph based on wow. the Staffordshire hoard I've right. got and I, I've got my phone I've got I'll show you I've got a picture of me yeah. wearing the helmet because it fits me right so anyway and he starts and she goes Mr. I, I before you go on I want you to know We've looked through it. We know all the good qualities of Mr. Kane. You can sit down. And at this point, she's talking at this level. Not a harsh word. Not an evil look. She's talking. And she goes, well, Mr. Kane, I'm going to let the deputy commissioner go ahead and do what Mr. I was going to do. And so she reads through and she's talking all this stuff. And then she comes back. She goes, now, I understand you're going to be deported. I said, well, yes, ma'am. She goes, um, how do you feel about that? I said, well, it really doesn't matter how I feel about it. The U.S. government has determined that I'm to be deported because I've been illegally in your country for 63 and a half years. She goes, but don't you feel like you're an American? I said, no, ma'am, I don't feel like I'm an American. She goes, well, do you feel British? I said, no, I don't feel British. She goes, well, well where do you think you belong? I said, I belong in the Isle of Man. That's what I feel. I'm Manx. 
And she goes, oh, well, that's interesting. She goes, uh, I actually looked that up. I didn't know where it was. She says, it seems to be a quaint little place with lots of little, you know, picturesque cottages and stuff on it. And I'm going, you know, because I'm waiting. Something, something's something got to drop on me. You know, is there a sword hanging above my head? What? I'm no amble or something. Yeah, you know, I mean, something. Yeah. And she goes, and then we break. And we haven't been there that long. We break. We go out. And I tell you, I, I, I go, what the hell's going on? He goes, well, I don't know. But like I tell you, sometimes they're different in the next hearing. We go back in there and she says, I find you suitable, Mr. Kane. And I yes. I really wish you well and stuff like that. Yes. Now, you know, it's got to go back before the governor, you know, and I wish you well and stuff. So it spends 90 days with the full board, all the board. How members. did you feel that? Quite honestly, I was, I, I was so... My stomach was in such flutters, I couldn't even eat that night. Yeah, yeah. Because I just kept thinking. Because I was a number one man. You know, and, and, and one, of the, one of the guys goes, are, are you going to the yard tomorrow? I said, no. I go, why not? I said, I think they may have paid one of the gunners to snipe me out of the tower. Yeah, you know, yeah, because yeah, yeah. we have so, gun towers. And they, go you know, so I'm just, yeah. I'm being like really cautious, right? And uh, my counselor calls me down, gives me the paper saying I'd been you know, found suitable, but now it's got to go 90 days to the full board. That means all 12 board members have to look it over and see if they think it's at the green, it was done and right. And then the third, last three days, it goes to the governor. Okay, so it goes to the full board. They pass it on to the governor. I get the notice. Okay, you know. So I'm saying, like I said, last time he waited, last two days. So I'm like, oh, man, I'm just waiting, I'm waiting, waiting. So I'm like, about two and a half weeks from that, the end time. My counselor calls me up at 5.30 in the afternoon, which usually the counselors leave at 5. She calls me at 5.30, calls my unit. I come to the phone, and she says, well, Mr. Kane, uh, ICE will be coming to pick you up in the morning. You're going to be sent down to R&R at 2.30 in the morning to be processed out. Good luck with your new life. Yeah. Well, I'm only allowed to take what I'm wearing and one small bag of, of items. Of course, you've got three yeah. before now. Yeah. Well, well, I had items. I had luckily, had, previously when I got found, I sent a lot of stuff back to the UK. Right. So I had a lot of things over here. But normally when they give you warning, they give you a week. Yeah. I didn't oh, get that. I've, I've, got, I've, I've got seven hours roughly to go to R&R. &R. So I ended up giving away stuff to my the, uh, uh, to guys here here keep this here here right, yeah. you know all this stuff yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah so but I had made a bag just as hopeful for my little carrying thing and that's what that patch on the yeah, side of the bag the patch, yeah, yeah. yeah and I had that on one side yeah well this this was on my beanie this was on my beanie, on beanie but I had that but on the other side of the bag I had the British flag um, you know stitched on and I had my name Kane. In a patch done, yeah. you know. So they're gonna move my back. Well, you can sure you can get it. And uh, so anyway, yeah. uh, for for a feeling that must have been. So, but the thing is that they, I'm wearing prison clothes still. So this is it, yeah. Yeah. Sure, the clothes in it. Hold on. You got the mic. There you go. See that. Yeah, it, it's it's a saying from the. It's got the three legs of the Isle of Man on it, yeah. but the the saying comes from the quiet man that John Wayne was in, when he gets into an argument with uh, the the brother of Maureen O'Hara and the thing, and the guy was uh, talking about I'm going to count to three, and John Wayne looks at him and says, if you count to three, you'll never hear the ref count ten. Yeah, and I put that on my I had that I sewed that yeah. up and put it on my back. And the guards were even going, well, what's that mean? I said, well, we'll have to see, won't we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, and I, and to me, I, it was one of the, one of the John Wayne films I enjoyed the most, I yeah, think, you know. Yeah, John Wayne films. Why, yeah, yeah. Why, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, uh, so I, I end up uh, going down, and 2.30 <clears throat> in the morning, the guard that was in R&R, &R, the release and release, the receiving and releasing unit, uh, where all the buses come in, people go out, and I didn't really know him, but he knew he knew of me, right? And he goes, "Yeah." He goes, uh, "So you're finally getting out of here, huh, Kane?" I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "Well, that's good." He goes, "I'm going to bring your uh, dress out because I had to turn my clothes in I was going to wear so they could search them, you know, make sure I don't have anything I'm not supposed to have." 
So I'm still in prison, my You're prison clothes. Huh? You're going out, not in. Well, yeah, but they don't want you taking certain things out either, you know. You know, you know, you, prison drugs might be worth more than out street drugs. You know, you go, hey, these were in prison, you know, that, you know, something I don't know. Anyway, but they didn't want. So he searches my clothes. And he brings them over to me and I dress out. And uh, he goes, well, you got to, he goes, why don't you put these clothes in your bag? Because I had some extra clothes there. I said, no, I'm only allowed to have what I can wear. So I end up putting a, I have like four shirts on and like, you know, three pairs of yes. uh, underground yes. skivvies. And then I got two pairs of jeans on. You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's it mean like that? Yeah. Well, but I mean, I'm sorry. Cause I, I like I said, I don't, I don't have, I don't even have a jacket. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I know, I know, you know, like what's funny is so many people in California thought that London was directly straight across from L.A. Yeah. And I tell them, no, try Nova Scotia. I said, yeah, I yeah. said, I said, we're, we're on different, you know, but, but people don't, like I said, the number of people who don't know geography in America is, is always amazing. Yeah. yeah. Even though it's taught in schools, people don't really catch on to it. And, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I, uh, uh, I got my stuff sitting there. And then right before shift change at 6 a.m., I had a bunch of officers who had been working the night shift who had known me at different jobs throughout the 12. Because I'd been to DVI the second time, 12 years. Right. So what's, what's DVI? DVI is Dual Vocational Institution, but it was known as Gladiator School because it had initially been opened up as a youth prison. Right. And they used to even say, even after we took it over and stuff, that when you got off the bus, they'd give you a trash can lid and a knife because you'd be fighting from the day you get in there. And I was there, when I was first there initially in 85, there was a 500-man ride on the yard with knives and weights and right. and stuff. So when you, when you saw, I've got to give yeah. you about four, when you first got sentenced, Jamie, yeah. right? so you're on the bus, where, where did you go first? I went to Vacaville, which Vacaville. Vacaville is California Medical Facility at Vacaville. Vacaville's a town. Yeah. And that's where I met Charles Manson and Ed Kemper. Edmund Kemper. Edmund Kemper. Yeah, Edmund Kemper. Yeah, Edmund Kemper. Oh, he fucking creeps me out. <laughs> well, you, well, here's what the thing. What kind of a man cuts his mother's head off and skull fucks it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, he's well, the man. He's put an head on the fucking man and he's yeah. going, look at you now, ma'am. Look yeah. at you. you <laughs> take a look at yourself now. <laughs> Did, you okay, Did you actually meet that? Did you actually meet that? Oh, yeah. Because here's sure. the thing. I met him the sec... The, 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 I got into... To Vacaville in the late afternoon, and they put me in a cell. And the cellie I had was like, you know, just kind of knowing me. But the next morning, they, they cracked the door for for chow for breakfast, and we go out. And then after breakfast, I had to come back to the cell. My cellie had to go do something else because they they when depending on where you are in your reception, you have different things you got to do. Yeah. I come back. They crack the door a couple hours later and tell me I got to come down for orientation. And then they basically hand you some paperwork and stuff. And I come down, there's like three guys all dressed in the prison blues. We're in this fluorescent green right. clothes. So we really stand out as new yeah. guys. Yeah. And we're in this thing and, and stuff. And uh, these three guys are talking to us. And they're really nice guys. They're, you know, they're telling, yeah, you know, and they know some of the guys because they're all coming back. To them. Yeah. And all of a sudden, in walks this guy that almost blocks the doorway. Yeah. You know, he's 300 pounds. He's like six, six nine. nine. You know, comes in, he's got these big horn rim, you know, black frame yeah. glasses. He comes in, he steps up this podium, and the podium is like right here yeah. at his waist. If, if you guys are all going to and Kemba is a prolific serial killer. I think he killed yeah. so like eight or ten women, was it? It's well, his, he killed, well, he killed his grandparents first. That was yeah, the first thing he did. Grandma. Well, no, he killed his grandparents, both of them. Yeah. And he was in, he was actually in a mental hospital behind that when he was a teenager. And then they decided to let him out. And he told them, I don't feel comfortable getting out. And they actually said that it was due to his, uh, they, that he had latent, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, he was coming into his puberty, latent yeah. puberty issues, but you'll work it out. You'll, you'll come to grips with it. But he actually told them, don't let me out. I don't feel comfortable. Okay. So, And they went ahead and overruled him. But anyway, so he walks in and he's just, the, the podium is just like at his waist. Yeah. You know, because he's so tall. The three guys in blue have gotten all the way against the wall behind us. They're as far away from him as they can get. And there's like all of us in between him. Every man must have a moral compass. 
You must not deviate from your moral compass. Remember that. And it was all in monotone. His whole, yeah, his whole, his whole, but, but yeah, but you want to think, you think that creeps you out. He does reading books onto tape for the blind at Vacaville. Nowhere. Yeah, he does. He, he was so one of the things. Blind people are fucking listening to him. Yeah, you're you're blind. And you're sitting there listening to him speak to you. And it was a dark and windy night. Oh, and she walked through the house and heard the creaking of floor. You know, I mean, oh, is this really the guy you want to hear? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if it's a love it's story. A documentary. <laughs> yeah. Last night, and yeah. he's fucking very intelligent. Oh no, yeah. Very, very intelligent yeah. guy, like. Yeah. I think, he, I think he killed. Was it eight or ten hitchhikers, girls, college girls? There, yeah, yeah. There was, there was a, a good number. Of them. He said, he said, he said I got sick of me. He said yeah. that had to win. It was all down to me, man. Yeah. It was me mother. She, you know, she got me little. Me little them all yeah. his life, just torturing him, saying you're a murdering little bastard. Yeah. You killed, you know, you killed your grandparents. You're a murdering little bastard. Well, even when he was younger, she was on him from the time he was basically born. Yeah, and he said I went in this night. He said, and she laid on the bed reading the, reading the paperback. He said, she said, I suppose you want to sit and talk all night, do you? He said, I just looked at her and thought, nah, I'm going to fucking cut your head off. <laughs> he got his fucking knife out, cut her head off, stuck it on the bamboo piece for a few days and just chatted away. Well, look at you now, ma'am. Fucking look at yourself now. Where's your morning? Why are you fucking whinging now? <laughs> Then fucking all yeah. sex with it and yeah. whatever he wanted. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck? He right. should have been on his fucking knees and executed a bullet in the back of his fucking head, surely. What a fucking creep. Yeah. But he did that to his mum. And he just phoned the sheriff's office and said, yeah. I've killed all these people. Yeah. He said, because it had to stop it, my mum. Yeah. It was my mum who was yeah. making me do it. Yeah. Yeah. And when I'd killed her, I thought, he, he did me. I have nothing else to do now. Mm. I didn't want to kill all those women. Yeah. Well, it was just for, because of what she'd done. Well, yeah. What she was doing to women. Yeah. So, who, who else were you? Who else were you? Well, Manson was there at Vacaville when I first got there. And Tex. somebody somebody came up Tex. to me. You know, Charles. Charles. Yeah, yeah Tex Watson, say. Charles Manson. Oh, yeah, that's right. But the guy came and told me, hey, me, you, know, you, you want to see Charlie? I said, Charlie. He goes, yeah, Charlie Manson. And he was working in the garden in the Catholic chapel at that time. So they walk... The guy walks me over and says, yeah, yeah, there he is. Now, remember, I was a teenager when all this stuff went down in the yeah. 60s. Yeah. And again, though I knew about it, I didn't really sit and watch the news. Yeah. And, you know, I had my you own life going. It. You know, yeah. I've got my own little thing going. Yeah. So I'm looking at the guy and he's he's not very tall. He's like five foot two, three. He was under four foot four, I'm sure. But I mean, he just wasn't very he wasn't impressive. He was he was just kind of scrawny, yeah. little, you know, and I was like. Oh, okay, that's Charlie. Because for some reason, I, I had this vision that I remember seeing a picture where two cops were holding on to him. So I was getting this idea he was really big. Yeah. But then later, somebody said, well, he was found hiding under a kitchen cabinet, which makes you to know he couldn't have been too big if he was yeah. hiding under a sink cabinet or something. Yeah. But anyway, so I had dealings with him where Kemper, I only had that one meeting with Kemper where I really didn't interact with him, but I kept thinking if I ever had to get in a fight with this man, I'd have to do everything I could to try to, you know, take him down because oh, this guy's just too freaking big. Huh? Oh, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. But, but I'm just, so my, my, you know, my, because I'm just now first in prison. But anyway, I see Manson and uh, he used to come by the chow, uh, the, the canteen line where you go to store and he'd have rocks he'd paint on and, and sign and he'd try to sell you these, right? You know, and it's not like he needed the money because he'd get loads of mail and money and yeah, stuff. Yeah, he's a but it was it was more it was the him. idea that he wanted more and more people to have something he's done type thing. It was like a yeah. promotional thing almost. Yeah. And I go, no. He goes, what? You don't want my? He goes, I'm more famous than Jesus fucking Christ and na 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 na. Is no. he actually going like that? In oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh no no no. He does. And and the thing is, here's the deal. He was always a petty criminal. And because I've met four members of the family, Bobby Boussoulet, Tex Watson, Bruce Davis, and him, I honestly think that all he ever really was was the figurehead. Yeah. Now, but if you think about it, when they talk about the Tate and LaBanca killings, Tex is the one that told the girls, Charlie said, let's do this, or do, tell us to do it. Okay, Charlie who? Charlie Watson 
or Charlie Manson. And I'll tell you, Charles Watson, when he when I met him at California Men's Con, he was the inmate minister for the Protestant chapel. He'd written the book, Will You Die For Me? and other stuff. And he basically ran that chapel. You know? So here's a guy who recruited the girls, took the girls to do on these killings and stuff, all that stuff. He was the charismatic one as far as, the, I mean, the good-looking, the charismatic, all that kind of stuff. Charlie was just this little guy that made a good little guru head of the family. You know, let's do dope, let's have sex, let's yeah. do... You know, and he could talk all the crazy. And that was the thing, is that once he went, knew he was going to prison, he knew this thing, he knew he'd never get out. So Charlie has two things he can do. He can either become just a, a working, you know, prisoner and just could live his life out, and, you know, or he can stay a celebrity. Yeah. For Charlie, staying a celebrity, you know, brings him all in. But when I was there at Vacaville, and we're talking like 84, yeah. you know, you're talking at this point in time that it's been like 15 years since his crimes. Yeah. Okay. And he was getting letters from young girls that hadn't been born when he, when he went down or were just new, you know, little kids asking to be John part of the family and sending him money that they stole from their families and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. He's a massive follower. Now he's huge. Absolutely huge. Yeah. But the thing was, so you had all this kind of stuff going on, yeah. you know? And it just, it's one of those things where, you know, but he used to come to the clinic because at that time, when I first got there, my very first job in prison was being a surgical tech. And they came the second day I was in prison. The captain, chief uh, medical officer, asked me if I'd come and work as a surgical tech for him while I was being processed through my orientation oh, no, I because I have the skills. Yeah. I have the skills they could use. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I went there. So when they actually did surgery, and I would go up there and, and be like a surgical nurse, hand the instruments to the doctor and stuff, and do aftercare. When I wasn't doing that, I worked on the ward, taking care of the inmates who had had surgery or who had other issues. Like we had one guy who'd, who had lost his legs, and he always needed a lot of care and stuff, and, and turned people that were paraplegic, quadriplegic, to get the blood keep from bed source and stuff like that. So I worked in the hospital. Well, he used to come in, and... He'd always try to hit, get guys working in the hospital to, to get drugs for him or get needles for him or get stuff like that. And when he'd come to me, I basically told him, you know, Charlie, get the fuck away from me. You, know, you, you, you can't talk to me. I can talk to you any way I want. If you don't like it, you know, we can deal. I, I, I don't have to take that. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to. Don't come back. But he was known to sometimes create such a disruption other guys could run in and grab the med cart and get in the oh, rum and, right. and get yeah. stuff out. Because he'd go in there and act all kinds of crazy. Yeah. And knowing that they'd have to put most of the staff on watching him, they couldn't watch other things. Yeah. So it was that kind of thing. But what ended up happening, he, I ended up leaving there before he did. Because shortly after I did, he got into an argument with a guy who was a Hare Krishna, you know, oh, right. yeah. in the hobby shop over religion. And the guy threw paint thinner on him and lit him up and burned part of his face. Yeah, burned part of his face and hair. Not seriously, not seriously, but, but uh, you know, and that's when he suddenly got sent to San Quentin. And that's when he kind of started on his road to being uh, under special protection things. Because he eventually went to Soledad, to the protective housing unit. And he was there with Juan Corona, which you may or may not know him. He killed like 40 some odd Mexican farm workers, yeah. you know, because he, he worked them to basically to death and then kill them rather than pay them. Yeah. And, and then he was there with Sirhan Sirhan right. that uh, we killed Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so he was there with those guys and stuff like that. So but I didn't know those guys, but other than reputation, but because they were in protective housing unit and, and on Solidad yeah. and I didn't do time to Solidad. But yeah, so, you know, there's that. But then like uh, another serial killer you would probably know is Herbie Mullen. And I was at CMC with Harry Mullen. And they want to talk about another intelligent man. He used to be able to read a, a dictionary with pronunciation in it. And he would read it. And then he'd walk over and talk to you because you, you know Korean. And he would talk to you, have you talk to him and stuff. And a week later, he'd be over there carrying on conversations with you. Just like that. He used to make money doing um, star charts. But not today, star chart. He would do your birthday star chart because he could see the stars and could wind them backwards. That's right. And he, he did. He actually had people coming from different 
colleges who were involved in astronomy and stuff coming there and paying them to to do these different things like that. And uh, he was a serial killer. But he his his drug of choice was a mixture of opium and LSD. <laughs> so he could see God. <laughs> so where, where about split? Like you say, you were the first one you were there. Yeah, Vacaville. I went to Vacaville first. I was supposed to go to San Quentin initially, yeah. but San Quentin happened to get closed for intake as I was getting ready to get shipped. So they sent me to Folsom. Folsom Prison. So, and, Cash's yeah. Place, yeah. Well, he did San Quentin as well. He did yeah, San Quentin as well. Oh, did he play that yeah, one? he played San Quentin and Folsom. But, uh, and I actually met one of the inmates who had been there at that concert. Yeah who got one of the harmonicas he threw out, because he actually threw about a half a dozen or so right. harmonicas out, and the guy got it. And a couple days after he had it, he traded it for some Snicker bars. Oh, my And regretted God. that forever. Yeah, yeah, regretted did. that forever, yeah. And, uh, but at the time, he didn't. He wanted some, some candy, and he didn't have any, and that's all he had worth anything that's to trade for. I, I, I wonder where it is now. Eh? Mm. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So what, what, what was Folsom Prison like itself as a, as a well, prison system? Was it, was it? Here's what happens. You drive up to Folsom mm -hmm. and you come in through Eastgate. And it, if you've ever seen the picture of Folsom, it's got a gun tower. It looks like a, a castle thing, mm -hmm. big stone thing, iron gate on it. And, stuff. and when we came through, <laughs> there was a sign right there that says, you know, give up all hope, ye, all the ye who enter this, this gates. Right, and you're like, and you hear the gate slam, <laughs> and then the bus drives, and we were on a bus called the Gray Goose, which was like a, a little school bus, round top, that was all you know, kind of a flat gray. And you come through the second gate, <laughs> you hear that, and there's a gunner, there's a gunner in the post above you, and then you drive down, and you drive up, and you came, actually drove the bus onto the yard back then, so we drive up on the yard, the yard's clear, there's nobody there. We get off, we get off to, at the R&R, &R, and the bus backs up and turns around and goes back out the gates. And so we're standing on the yard, and uh, the sergeant comes out, and one of the one of the guys that came with us was a queen. You know, you know it was a guy who was, he didn't want to leave Vacaville, and the, a lot of queens were at Vacaville. So he actually queened up while at Vacaville, so he, he wouldn't get sent to Folsom. Right. Yeah, you know, that was what he was hoping for, but he got sent anyway. So he's standing between me and this other guy, and we're in we're in two lines. And there's like I think there were I think there was twelve of us um, that came because they would hold you for till they got a, a, a bus of number, and they took. We have the sergeant comes out and he, <clears throat> he's going, I want to welcome you to Folsom State Prison. It was built in 1880, you know, by the blood, sweat, and tears of convicts. Every bit of this granite oh. was quarried from here. We're built inside the quarry. And he's talking, yes, you heard Johnny Cash sing the song. And all of a sudden, out of five gate right here, which is going into the building, five building, and goes into three and two and four, the gate slams open real quick and out sees this little Mexican guy running, right? And they got a little bit of a fenced off yard. And right behind him is this great big Mexican with a fucking knife this long. <laughs> and he's running, the guy's running for it, and his shoe comes off. And he stops oh, to get his shoe. And the shoe. moment he does, the guy gets on him and goes, rah, rah, rah. Oh, None of the gunners can lock and load. It's happened so fast. And the guy stabs him about half a dozen times, throws the knife down, throws his hands up. Oh, no. Right? Oh, Guards come running out behind him. And they gaffle him, they cuff him, and they call for medical, and they bring this gurney out, and they just throw this limp, bloody mess onto the gurney and run it back in there. The sergeant, who's looked over there, turns back, and without break, thing he goes, and as you notice here at, Old Fol at Folsom State Prison, we have unscheduled extracurriculum activities happening at any given time, <laughs> so I would recommend you don't participate in those if you can help it. Yeah. Let's go inside. And all of a sudden, the guy, queen passes out. And he goes, all right, you two pick your girlfriend up and take her in. <laughs> you know, and so I had me and the other guy grab an arm. What did you think when he said that? Did you think, well, 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 yeah, well my, 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 my first thought was, this, this is going to be a long one. This is really going to be a long one. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Jericho Mile. A long time. Okay. Oh, yeah. The Jericho Mile was filmed at Folsom. And the Jericho Mile is about a convict in there who runs the track. And the thing is, he's actually faster than 
the guys on the street running the Olympics. Olympics yeah. So the idea is they're looking at him getting a chance to run the Olympics to, yeah, you know, for yeah, U.S. Right now, yes. But then they cancel it. But the thing was, they actually built the track at Folsom for the movie. But the thing is, it's supposed to be a, a mile track or something. Yeah. It's not. It's it's a track that would basically be double the size of, of the downstairs you've got there. But they just the camera action shows it. So they get there, and I'm looking for that the big track because I remember the movie. Yeah. They go, that's it. Yeah, we're like, what the <laughs> fuck? You know, it's like, <laughs> six times for a mile. Yeah, but the thing was, the rule was, you couldn't at that time. They weren't letting you run. You could walk it, but if you stepped on the track, you had to keep walking. The only way you stop is get walk off the track. Yeah. You don't sit down. You don't stop and talk to anybody. You know, you got three walking together or two talking together off the track. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, and so you, you had you, you had this thing, all this kind of, uh, of situation where, but, I mean, I wasn't there but maybe a week. And we heard the heard the the rumor about a guy in the auto shop. They they had a big emergency count because they were missing somebody. And interesting in prison, I used to tell guys all the time that accountability is really important. They can't lose one of us or gain one of us. You know, either way, they get unhappy. Yeah. Well, one guy they couldn't find, and uh, they checked the work board where you put your ID in when you go down to the lower yards. Nobody had, didn't everybody had their IDs out. Blah blah blah. <clears throat> Finally, they do in a search. So we're, we're all, they have us come out, stand on the rail, go search. They're searching ourselves in case we got somebody stashed under the bunks or, you know, I think. And they go, they put us all back in. So they finally go down to the Vogue area and they go down there and walk into the auto shop and they see a pair of legs sticking out from under this car. And what had happened was this guy owed a drug debt and he was on one of the little rollers under the car working. They rolled him out. Stabbed him a bunch of che- times, chest, back on the- <clears throat> and then took the wheels off the the front end of the car, and then dropped the car on his chest oh. and took the the thing away. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, so I mean, it was like nobody's yeah. business. It's yeah. just the way they do things, you know. And so, you know, like, yeah, rough. Yeah. So San, San Quentin was that similar sort of stuff? Was that well, San Quentin was a. San Quentin has death row on it. Well, famous, isn't it? Well, San Quentin was the first prison, 1850. It actually started as a ship, a prison ship right there, and then they right. built the prison. And it, so, but they have the death row there. Right. You know, up in, in uh, North Block, they have the death row. And, um, but it's, you know, they're, they, the, one of the big stories there is the Rub-A-Dub-Dub Boat Club. You ever hear of that? Okay. Uh-huh. Well, every year they have a, a, a yachting uh, or a boat, a boating or a, a thing that goes out in the yeah. water right out there. <clears throat> and one year they had some inmates who worked in the right place, get raincoats and stuff, and they put together an inflatable raft right. and, you know, had their little deal. And, they, and as they were trying to push off, a guard came down and said, you guys having problems? Well, yeah, we're a part of the, the boating thing, but the current pushed us over here. Oh, here. And he called another guard and said, let's get these guys back in the water. Hopefully you guys can catch up with everybody else. And pushed them off. And the guys like, <laughs> Yeah, that, that was always kind of, you know, they were joked at about, you know, you know how, uh, they clowned them about that. But Folsom, you know, they, they talk about the, you know, the song about old, about Folsom, say prison. I'll hear the train a-coming, yeah. it's rolling round the bend, and the I ain't heard the sunshine since, I don't know when, I, you know, yeah. that time. Well, interesting enough, <clears throat> the only train at Folsom was they used to have a narrow gauge rail that would take the quarried stone up to the bigger rail, and then they would lift it up on bigger trains to take off with it. When they stopped quarrying and thing, they actually rolled the, the train back in, under the, one of the hills, they had a, a, a tunnel thing they built. They rolled it back in there and collapsed the thing because nobody wanted the narrow gauge train. And so it's still there. And I used to have guards used to go over there and take photos and bring them over and show us in the, in the watch office and stuff like that. And because I worked as a captain's clerk, I had access to a lot of the old logs. And I used to also have to do what they call DAR, which is a daily activity report. And we had, we had ghosts at Folsom. And there were times when guards would come to me with a report about something they heard or saw, particularly Tower 13. 
is we used to be a um, punishment management, you know, where they used to soak down these canvas um, um, straight jackets and then strap you into them. And then it would cause where they'd be get so tight, you would actually lose blood on your fingertips and stuff and actually lose fingers or hands and stuff. And guys would moan and, and they'd be chained to walls and stuff. And there were guards that would write these reports. And the first time I got one, I'm looking at this thing, I'm going, you want me to put this in the report? Yes, please, and be sure you log it. You heard chains rattling. I said, well, this is a prison. But yeah, but, not, but there's no, no, no reason to have chains over there. You heard somebody moaning. Right? And I'm thinking he's clowning me, right? This is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this guard brought this in just to clown me, right? So I walked to the captain and go, uh, Captain, I want you to approve that report before I put in anything. He looks at it and goes, yep. He signs off it. Well, I've got a captain's signature on it. It's official as far as I'm it's concerned. It's a noble thing. Yeah. And, then he, and then he brings me these logbooks and from you know, way back even into like the 20s of, of ghosts, I think. And in 5 building, which I was in, that was the first building built there. <clears throat> and they had carved... It, the, it was built 1850. No, no, it, it, Folsom, it was 1880. 1880. But they carved granite blocks and, and built these cells, and we had solid doors with just holes drilled in for ventilation. And um, you'll see that if you look at one of my videos. I've got the stuff posted up on it, and that um, show weapons and stuff. But uh, And I got one picture where you got a pair of eyes looking out from the slot, because we had a like, metal slot. And they got these big bars that come together and then a bolt, big padlock goes on it and the key lock I mean the big <clears throat> but it's just but inside there's not smooth walls they've got little divots because they're right. the stone yeah. and um, you have what they call the washer man which is you'll, he'll show up and he'll always be down he'll be way down at the end of the tier and you'll see him walking across and then you'll see him walk into one of the cells and guys in that cell on a number of times that are awake when he walks in there and we'll be starting screaming and hollering and be wanting to be moved out of that cell. And, um, you know, they, they had other things like that. Um, <clears throat> they have the, where the original, when I worked in the hobby shop there, the counselor's office for building two was above me. When they were redoing the floor, they took the linoleum and all the stuff off. They found the trap door for the hangman's thing right there. And it actually dropped right above my desk. So if somebody if somebody dropped through it, I'd have been kicked in the head. But but my we had the thing inside was blocked off, and then the counselor. But the counselor who has her a little cubicle that was above it wouldn't come back and sit in, in that office anymore. She's absolutely not. I'm not going to be there. But they had because they used to use this big pipe. They put the rope over there. But where we had our quote package room thing, there were 13 cells, and that's where they put the guys in for, who were going to be executed, and. When they took one out to be executed, everybody would be moved one cell closer. Oh, God. Yeah. Fuck it out. I'm in cell three. Next we have a fucking two million. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. Like so there was like all these different other little things going on, you know. And, you know, but I, I mentioned about, about some of the ghost stories we had there and, you know, different things along that line, you know. Um, but. Folsom had a lot of history, and quite honestly, to me, Folsom had a better history than San Quentin. Did. Yeah. But uh, San Quentin was much wider open. It's more famous for me, like. Well, you, yeah, you I mean. You mentioned Folsom, and, and you mentioned San Quentin, and yeah. I go San Quentin. Yeah. Yeah. But kind of one of the bigger differences was with Folsom, we had what they called gang showers. And they're like just a big shower, you put like 16 guys in there. But then they decided to make these other little showers, and they had like you know, five little spigots. And so if we were going to shower together, we'd have to hook arms so you could wash yourself because cause you're going to be bumping each other. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be able to get your hand. So the idea, the, the somebody, I don't know where, but they started selling a thing called soap on the rope. And yeah. the idea was that, so that way you don't have to worry about dropping the soap and having to bend down to get it. But then, then they came out with Pick shower. Up the soap. Then they came, but, but then they came out with shower gel. Pick up the soap. Then they came out with shower gel later, and guys would be in there with shower gel and go, "Oh man, I spilled it all." Yeah, well, sorry about your luck. You know, so, you know, but I mean, yeah, but it, but luckily as a clerk, I often had 
a, a private shower because they would have one for us so we could shower over there. So I didn't have to put up with a lot of that stuff. But you Where did that go from But they used to have but they used to have showers on the yards for us. And to give you an example, Folsom had one it was in the back of Blood Alley. And Bloody Alley was called that because there were so many killings and stabbings in there. But the problem is is that very in the back, you go to take a shower, you've got to have buddies go watch you, right? Well, the gang guys would send somebody else back there. The problem was, that's how they killed their own members that they were ready to kill. Because it was the only place in the yard you didn't have a gunner could see you. Yeah. Right? But when I went to DVI the first time, the only shower in the yard was a cold water hose that came over. So you get on a yard that's got 500, 750 guys out there. Cold shower. To get butt naked in front of everybody. To shower because the idea is if you go to the shower or go to the yard, you can't come back to shower in the in the unit. Yeah. So otherwise, you have to come back and do a whore bath in the cell off the sink. A yeah. whore bath. Yeah, a whore bath. It's understood. Yeah. This is good. Nuts, nuts, wash. elbows. Yeah. Wash. Right, and butt, yeah, cheek. Yeah. You know, yeah, a little bad whore bath. Wash, yeah. Yeah. Wash, yeah. yeah. So anyway, but they call them whore baths over there. Whore baths. And stuff. <laughs> but so, but yeah, but I mean. But yeah, you were expected to shower on the on the yard and stuff like that. But I was I was like say I was at DVI because that's where I fought pineapple the first time. Uh, um, yeah. Do you want to tell us your yeah. story? <clears throat> pineapple. Yeah. 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 When, when I fought pineapple, I was at DVI, and uh, they had um, I was I just gone out to the yard, and I'd been out there for a while, and the weight piles were divided by races, right? And I usually worked out in the gym because you could give weights and nobody gave a shit what group you would just get your weights. But I wanted to get into the 300-pound club, and you had to do the weights in the 300-pound club thing. But I did what I could in the gym and stuff like that. But I was out on the, out on the yard, and I just signed up to get to, to be able to go tra- challenge the 300, get my 300-pound card yeah. for uh, bench press. And I get, my, I get a call to report to my job at the infirmary. I no sooner walk up the yard to where the guard's post is and just step through where they're going to pat me down and the alarms go off. A 500-man riot, throwing weights, pulling knives, you know. All the kids. All the, like yeah, that. It just, yeah, it was, it was a, it was, no, no, the thing was, yeah, well, the thing was you had, you know, and I don't know who started, but it was like, the whites ran against the blacks. Well, now the Southerners back the whites and the Northerners back the blacks and, and everything. Stuff. And then if you're an other and you're in the middle, you've got to fight anybody who comes by because you don't know if they're going to try to get you. because you're really yeah. And it's just this big, massive ring. Mm. And I'm, of course, I'm going and I get there and my boss goes, where the hell were you? So I just came off the yard. Oh, you created that. No, I, I you called me to work. He goes, yeah. He goes, well, he goes, we're going to have a lot of work coming up and for the next uh, four or five hours, we were bringing people in, and, and uh, we sent, I think, probably a dozen people or more out to the hospital with serious injuries. Some of them didn't come back, you know, because uh, one of the things with start fights sometimes would be, say, a black guy walks by a white guy on the wind, white bench, grabs a dumbbell real quick, and smashes you in the head with a 60-pound weight. But, well, that solves your day. Yeah. But now your buddy's got to do something about it. So now that's, you know, everything. So, I mean, it's just that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Never ending. Yeah. No, never ending. And you know, things like so. Yeah, there was all these. Yeah, you know, like since it was always that. But I, I got my opportunity to go and do the weight pile, uh, the the the, you know, the three hundred pound club thing. And they had Olympic iron rather than just regular pig iron. Yeah. We had big Olympic iron reels and stuff. And I got out there, and um, you're supposed to get a spotter. Well, I was listed. Uh, the guy asked me, "What are you?" I said, "I'm an Islander." And the coach writes Islander down, right? But no Islander was willing to spot for me. Right. Because they were all kind of like, you know. So we had this guy named Iron Mike. He's a black guy, big husky guy. He's one of the few blacks that worked his legs as well as his upper body. So he was very symmetrically built. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't and, just, yeah. And he, and he I knew, I'd known him for a while. And, uh, you know, he had a, a slight skin problem. So I used to get him special creams from the clinic. You know, mm-hmm. to help him with his acne, acne and stuff, you know, yeah. yeah, and stuff. And so he was very appreciative. So he was he's spotting for me, and I got it. I I just pushed it through. And I made it up to three hundred and eighteen pounds, you know. And they they said you go you got to get you know this many times. And I actually pushed it a few more times, got it yeah, just yeah, to make sure, yeah. and and stuff. So and I okay, we're gonna give you your card. And it was right after that, 
the following day when I was inside working out with the other guy and Pineapple approached me and uh, wasn't happy. He told me, you're not an Islander. And I told him I'm from the Isle of Man. How much more of an Islander can I be? And uh, I said, where are you from? And he says, well, my mom is from New Zealand and she's Maori and I, my dad's from Samoa. So I'm half Maori and half Samoan. And I went, well, good for you. I said, but you notice neither of those called islands, which probably wasn't, you know, it's probably a dig that yeah, I probably shouldn't yeah. have done. But anyway, that's when he said, well, if I ever hear the word islander come out of your mouth again, I'll have to, you know, you know, bust you. Yeah, so I hit him first, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was, so when I cracked him, Hit him here, and that's when, like, say, I broke these knuckles yeah, you here. Yeah, I was going to say this. Yeah. God, and then, right, and then I had to have the lunate bone replaced because it actually shattered in there. Yeah. And uh, it was some, it was some falls. Oh, I hit him with everything I had, and but only moved him about a foot. Yeah. Yeah, you know, which was kind of a shock to me, but uh, hopefully my face didn't give too much away. Imagine the power if you bench him three eight eight. <clears> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah, but he was benching at this time five thirty. I mean, he's got 26-inch biceps, 60-inch chest. Yeah, I've got yeah. about a 50-inch chest, and I've got, like, just about 18-inch arms. Yeah. You know, big disproportion. And he's four inches taller than I am. So big disproportion here. So he picked me up, and he threw me back against the wall, threw me against the wall, picked me up, threw me up, threw me back down. And then that, he did it probably for, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe a dozen times. Now we've got guards in the in the in the thing, and they never noticed this apparently, at least not in any report. Never showed any report. And he started walking away, and I go, "I'm not done with you," and I'm <laughs> and I'm getting to my feet. And he turns around, and he goes, "What?" I said, "I'm not done with you." And he walked back over, and he, when he came back, he had this side of his face more facing me, and so I hit him with everything I could here, and that's when I broke that knuckle across there. But I hit him just where it hit right, and it fractured here, and it fractured right in the chin. So he had three breaks in his jaw. And again, he bounced me off walls and, and stuff, and you know, and then walked away. And I'm trying to get back up, and I just I just couldn't get my legs underneath me. Yeah. The will was there, but just couldn't get yeah, yeah. And the black guy I was working out with comes over and says, man, I wish you told me you were going to do that. I could have sold tickets. We could have made money because that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen done, he tells me. So I go to, to the clinic because my hand's swelling up really bad, this one. Not so much this, but this one's swelling up. So I go to the clinic, and as I'm going in, he's coming out of the x-ray area, and we have inmate x-ray techs. That was one of the vocations they trained you to do, which they later wouldn't let you work on the streets as one because that changed the laws. So guys went, he wasted years learning to be one, can't work in it. So he comes out and he goes, sits on one of the little bench things out there to be treated. And uh, the nurse walks me, I walk in, and she goes, what happened? I said, oh, weight pile injury. I said, bang my hand on the weights. So he walks up and tells the, the inmate, x-ray tech, yes, it's here, you know, he, yeah. he's got a weight pile injury here. And the guy looks at me and goes, weight pile injury, huh? That's two in the last 10 minutes. You know, he goes, the guy's jaw out there also got dropped. He dropped a bar on his jaw. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I go in and they x-rays it. And he looks at me. And he goes, you know, they're never going to put the two and two together. He tells me this. Talking about the staff. He goes, yeah. they're never going to put this together. You know. And so I go out. And I'm on the other one. And we're looking at each other. And, and in his weird way, he kind of gives me a smile with his eyes. Because he can't really move his mouth too much. And then two weeks later... I get a, I get this one young Islander come up on me, and he comes up on me like he wants to do something. Now this hand's in a cast right now because they've you know, yeah, but they haven't they ha the bone still broke. I haven't they haven't, all they've done is casting me up because yeah. they're still working on whether what they're going to do about my my hand right. And um, um, he comes up and he goes, pineapple wants to see you. And I'm thinking, God. I'm going to have to beat him to, with this one because <laughs> this one I can't do because i got a cast on it. Right? And uh, I go, okay. He goes, yeah. He goes, we're out on the grounds at this at our table because people chose different areas for They have a table, and that becomes their territory. Can so, you just stop a minute, please? No. Yeah, go on, Matt. Lick. Yeah. Your sister that you've never met, 
Who yeah. are you looking for? Well, she just messaged me. Has she? And I hope if my phone rings the next few minutes, come down, it'll be her. <laughs> Found your sister? Yeah. He's got a sister here, but he's never met. Just found his sister? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think she's oh, in Australia, but we've got her in Anyway, I just thought I'd... Uh... Really, you've just found out his long-lost sister? Yeah. Fucking <laughs> jackpot. Well, I've been doing down there. You know, when we were talking to you shouting at us, that was yeah. him telling me about it, and then I came in and had a look. I found a family, but she just backed off to um, Australia, I think. I'll go, I'll go and have a tap and I'll let you. We'll have a tap and put you up with him. Well done, Fraser. Well done, Fraser. Sorry, Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Jamie. Yeah. The best of this, the best of all, the best of all. Yeah, yeah. good on you, mate. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. I've got a long yeah. sister. Hey. Yeah. 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 He's good at what he does, you know, Fraser. Yeah. He is really yeah. good at what he does. Do I have a little free there? Well, quickly. well that or I could just quickly finish this yeah, little bit. Finish so, yeah, go on, sorry. So anyway, I go out to their table, and they've got a big luau birthday pre uh, party for him. But of course, he can't eat any of it because he, he's drinking things through his straws because his mouth's all wired up. Oh, shit. And, uh, but they they have, like, they've gotten ham that they stole from the kitchen, and they got pineapples, and they they got rice, and they're doing a the little luau thing. And I'm out there, and, and through his mouth, he's going, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not as strong as an islander. You're not as tough as an islander. You're not as big as an islander. <laughs> he goes, but in my opinion, you got the heart of an islander. So as far as I'm concerned, you can call yourself an islander. Yeah. You're oh, thank you. Islander. And then I, I, I earned his respect at that because we tested each other's metal and we, yeah. you know, and, and stuff. And, and quite honestly, I've, I've thought many times, if I hadn't done that then, yeah. To have walked all over you. It would have. A lot would, of people would yeah. have walked all yeah. over you. Yeah. yeah. You've got to yeah. second. But because I did that, and everybody knew pineapple, and, and like I said, pineapple was known to, to club people and knock yeah. them smooth out. You had a bit of respect yeah. in them. Please. Yeah. So people, and then like I said, like people go, oh man, he's the guy fought pineapple and broke pineapple's jaw. Yeah. That was the biggest thing. That's a killer in you, that kid. That's a killer, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, a but a Viking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, but it was just so, because, but the number of guys came and go, man, why didn't you tell me you were going to do that? I said, no, you don't understand. It wasn't planned. It's when he said he would smash me that I felt I had to do it first. Because I said, I didn't figure if I let him come at me, I'd get the opportunity. Because if he'd hit me first, yeah, you know, because like I said, there were, I, I knew too many guys that he'd hit and completely knocked him smooth out. Strike while he yeah. comes out. Yeah, he just, you know. And his favorite thing was to hit you right here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, and so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, yeah. So yeah. where do you see yourself now? Uh, what do you see for the future? What do you want I, to happen? Well, like I said, you know, I, I've got a lady that I care a lot about. Okay. And quite honestly, uh, I met her over two, about two, a little over two years ago. Yeah. And, um, uh, I came up eight times before I actually moved to Newcastle. Right, so she's yeah. from that way. She's, she's born and raised in Newcastle. Right, right. You know? that's, that's and, uh, yeah, Newcastle and, and the thing was that uh, before I, I moved up, the furthest she'd ever been was Durham. All right. And I've taken her to uh, Liverpool when I went to do the Billy Moore podcast. Yeah. And I took, her, I took her on the Magical Mystery Bus Tour. Oh, and of course, yeah. they take you where the Beatles things yeah, are, Beatle and Cross. they play Beatle, mu Beatle music. And I knew every song, <laughs> and I sang every song, and we got a round of applause from the people yeah. on the bus, including the driver and tour guy. And then uh, I took her to uh, Manchester because uh, my dad uh, was born in Manchester because my granddad was on a variety tour, and I uh, went to go see where my dad was born. It doesn't exist, but there's a big park. Built or where, where he, so we got pictures of us at the park oh, on nice. there. Um, I took her, to, I've taken her to London once. Uh, we're going to go again in a, probably next, in the end of the month or next month and take one of her older granddaughters who's really into dinosaurs so she can see the Natural History Museum yeah, and take you. her up in the yeah. eye so she can Great. see London from a sky. So we're going to, we're going to do that. Uh, taking her to the Isle of Man twice when my birth was registered. I wanted her there to yeah. go with, be experience it with me, yeah. and then I took her for the TT, um, yeah. and uh, you know, and like right now she's in Turkey with uh, one of her son's family. They were there for ten days. She comes back on right. Tuesday, and I'm already planning. We I, in Turkey. Yeah, uh, Antalya, uh, yeah. something like that's where they where it is. Yeah. But uh, they really nice five star hotel, yeah. dozen pools and yeah. all that stuff, all Very inclusive. Nice. 
looking and at. I found uh, I went and looked at uh, a couple of tour uh, tour company things and I found a possible couple of possibilities we've talked about she talked about doing a cruise um, she'd never been on a ferry till I took her she'd never been on a plane till I flew her over the Isle of Man yeah. um, so I've got her those uh, but I've talked to her about uh, I saw a really nice uh, like a, I think it's a seven day or nine day excursion to Cuba Oh, very oh, nice. I always wanted to go yeah. to Cuba. And like I said, I speak a little bit of Spanish and understand a yeah. little bit more. Yeah. And I thought that'd be a good, because funny enough, the only place in Cuba I'd ever been to was Guantanamo Bay at the military base, because <laughs> Americans weren't allowed to go to the other side of the you know, yeah. thing. So it was always funny, because every time I see the, the thing when they do a few good men, they go down to Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. And it's really funny, because if you've ever seen that movie, A Few Good Men, yeah. Yeah, the, Jack, Jack the Jack Nicholson character, you know, people don't realize that that's how like my gunny and people they point out we you know we're what keeps people safe from the monsters mm -hmm. you know that's what we do we stand that wall we deal with that so others can sleep safely at night yeah. and so that speech he gave i could hear officers and, and gunnery sergeants i knew giving that same speech you know you know and, 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 you know, so when people are thinking, oh, he's, he's insane. No, no. And that's why he tells them, you know, then you get a gun and you stand on the wall. and you, But you're in this little pissy ass place where you're, you know, safe and secure. But I'm the one that put that freedom there for you. Yeah. I'm the one that put my life on the line so you can have that, yeah. you know. And that's the thing. So it's, it's all those kind of deals. But, yeah, uh, but I thought Cuba would be nice because I, I actually like, I knew a lot of Cubans. I helped a lot of them get the amnesty. Uh, <laughs> uh, I talked about going to Rejavec, Iceland, because I'd love to see. I want to see the Northern Lights, and that's a great yeah, place to do it. Northern Lights. Yeah. Uh, the Shetland Islands. Well, yeah. A few years back. Fantastic yeah. to look at. Yeah. Uh, we, but we've talked about doing a cruise either up to uh, the Norwegian area or the Mediterranean. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's all about, like I said, I told her when I got with her, I said, look, I, I'll, I'll promise you that I will try to make your life as happy as possible and I'll try to make it an adventure. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. Oh, you know, yeah. and, I hope you get, I hope you get the door. And, and that's, that's why when she was offered the chance to go to Turkey, because there was a, a thing where one of the people that was supposed to go couldn't get their passport because of all the same going yeah, on. They, and they asked her if she'd go. And she looks at me and she goes, would you mind if I went? I told her, "Hell, get get going." I said, "Enjoy it." I mean, do it. Don't don't. Uh, yeah, I want you to go. I want you to enjoy this. You know, it was almost like I I think that people were so surprised that I was so supportive. But that's what I thought we were supposed to be. And like I said, and considering my two failed relationships previously, this one is, it, it, you know, I mean, she built a, a, a shed in her garden for me to, to have, which tells me that's how you know you're loved. If you're a woman, yeah, she gave me gave me a, a bedroom to turn into my office. Um, she cooks like nobody's business. She makes an excellent quiche. Yeah. You know, I never had quiche till I had hers. And, I, you know, because in America, when you think quiche, you, you think uh, beads and Roman sandals and gay nice. people yeah, and yeah, you know yeah, right. and so it's like you know so quiche is not something bikers usually yeah, yeah, eat yeah, you know yeah. but no but she's taught me a lot she's one of the reasons why i used to just dress in black you know um more biker garb but she's gotten me brighter colored shirts to wear and yes yeah, you know, things like that you know so yeah. you know i i like to think that she's making me a better person and hopefully i'm see when you, you know, talk about jimmy he's going to smile and he's going to yeah, yeah, smile yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that sparkling oh, in your yeah. eye well, like I said, I'm going to go pick her up. She's, they're coming in early in the morning on Tuesday. And my thing was that I uh, planned to be at the airport to pick her up. Yeah. Because the, they, they went from her son's house and they took two taxis because it's five people and all their luggage. And they were talking about going back to her their house. But they're going to be so knackered from because they check out tomorrow morning at 10 and then have to sit until 9 o'clock at night to catch the plane. They're going to be so tired and knackered. And I told her, no, I want, I'm going to come pick you up and bring you home so you can sleep in your own bed. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and she's like, oh, I don't want you to be a bother. I said, it's not a bother. It's what I do. You know, it's... it's, it's, it's what you do for each other, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, but see, she would love to have come to this because she's gone to my... She's gone to the one with Billy Moore yeah, and yeah, Paul yeah. Stansby. You know, 
just because she supports me on my own things, you know. Yeah, of course. And and it's you know, she's and, done the right and yeah, yeah, it's nice yeah. yeah. And, and, you when you do yeah. Right and, and but it's just so funny because, like I said, you know, uh, as she tells me, we'll we'll make it no matter what, you know. And but like right now, like I said, I I figured out that through savings and stuff that. I'm likely going to be able to, that between the two of us, we'll be able to afford two holidays next year. So, Brilliant. you know, Good. but, Good. you know, we, 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 like I said, we still got the, to go down to London with the granddaughter yeah. and like, I'm taking her to the hoppings. Uh, oh, the hoppings I'm taking her to that. Awesome. I've never been to it, but I haven't been to one for four. I haven't been to one 40 years. Wow. So this will be the first one I've gone to in 40 years. And great. she likes it. And then her birthday's coming up and I've already found out the restaurant. It's her favorite restaurant. Tomorrow I, I'm going down to a cake shop. Because she's going to be 61. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little custom cake made, and it's going to say Sweet 16 on it. Because, oh, yeah, you know, being dyslexic and numbers yeah. couldn't be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, and I, I've got, I, I bought her, I bought her uh, a couple of gifts, and, yeah. you know, I, hopefully I'm she'll like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. honestly, Jamie, it's your story. Yeah. I mean, it is. I think it is. From, from day one to. to Canada to America to the orphanage to, I mean, fuck it. It, it needs to be made into a movie. Listen, if there's anybody out there who wants to make a movie of this or a fucking good TV series, I'll tell you. You've got you, a, you need to be getting on this, guys. Honest to God. Definitely. I think it's fucking proper movie material. It's really yeah. good. And I'll Let's have it. I'd love to see it. <laughs> I've, I mean, okay. I've enjoyed meeting up with you as well. It's been well, this is this has been crazy. this has been really great, and, and like yeah. I said, and the fact that you know I got chauffeur driven here was really yeah. an amazing thing nice and stuff. Bentley. Yeah, oh, very so, nice Bentley. I say this week, this is the first time we've done it in yeah. this place. We knew so it was a bit. There's a couple of noises in the background there, but you know, we'll yeah, do we'll, we'll, we'll tweak that. Yeah, we'll tweak no problem. We've left the doors wide open and all that. Yeah, yeah, but like I said, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm hoping that it's well received and yeah, you know, and stuff like that. But like I said, you know, um, yeah, like I said, for me, I'm like I said, I'm I'm taking every day as it goes. I'm yeah. like I said, I'm 68. I wake up vertical every morning. Um, I've had this knee re- totally replaced. And it's I've been walking up and down hills and everything else with it, not really having a problem. Yeah. This one that was the one they were originally going to do first before they found how bad the other one was. Uh, ever since I had the surgery, it hasn't been a bother. <laughs> so I keep thinking it saw what happened to the other guy and went, "I'm good, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I ain't going to be all that done to me." But eventually, you'll probably have to have that one done too and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But no, like I said, you know, uh, I still want to see as much. I want to go to Scotland. I, I really want to go up there. I love the Highlands. You know, well, I have, I have, funny enough, I took creative writing in, in, in prison at DVI when I was there. And one of my uh, instructors lives in Edinburgh now. All right. He met a Scottish lady and, you know, and they stayed, she moved out to California with him for a while. They did like four or five years. She said, I'd like to go home. They came out, found a house and he moved out there. And that's, he says he's, he's perfectly contented up there, yeah. but I've let him know about my successes and he's been very happy with, cause I used to, I used to sit and tell stories while we were in class between breaks, right? I'd be telling stories and he's like, I hope you're writing these down. I said, writing them down. I said, they're, in, they're engraved because that's what I'm saying is that for me, I don't have to constantly hesitate stuff because I'm just relieving a memory. Yeah. So it just rolls because it's it's, it's, it's like seeing a film in my brain. I'm just it's <laughs> the opposite for me. You know. It's exactly yeah. the opposite. I can't remember half of what I've done <laughs> because it was drugs, drink, yeah. cocaine, loads yeah. of large amounts. So half the time I was on my fucking tits. You know what I mean? I didn't know what I was doing. So I've got people saying to me now, remember? And I'm <laughs> no, like, I don't no, remember. I don't remember doing that. I'm yeah. like, what can you do like? And I'm like, yeah. Wait, there'd be Paldic in there last week, just sat in there, and I went, remember the Cadillac you had? Cadillac? Yeah. You want a fucking Cadillac? I said, I've never owned a Cadillac, but when you fucking have. Yeah, you did as well, yeah. Have I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what, what it was like, yeah. yeah. one, one of my club brothers, a guy named Thumper, one day he, he used to. You know, smoke a lot of weed, and he used to drop pills that you know, bennies and stuff yeah. like that. And he'd have a little bit of of a memory issues and stuff. And I remember one time we were we were at a campsite, and and he almost always wore the exact same clothes. I mean, I don't think you know. I think if he washed them is because it rained, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the time he's sitting there, and he's got his jacket, and he goes, 
And he's got $15,000 in his jacket. Does anybody know where I got this from? <laughs> and I'm like, well, no. When, when, when did you get it? And he goes, well, I don't know. When was the last time I was inside this jacket? You know? Yes, and, and stuff. Come to find out, a girl he knew had been at a club, and she'd, she'd actually stolen this from a customer and then put it in his jacket. And he'd had it for like almost a month and never knew he had all this. Wow. So he's like, huh, 15000 huh? Oh, it back in. Yeah. yeah, and, and I, I go. What? I said. Well, I said. What are you gonna do with it? He goes. I'm gonna put it back in there. Maybe it'll get more. Because <laughs> he could. He had no idea. And then it wasn't until about six months later when the girl came to him, and and she goes, uh, "Could you give me some money?" And he goes, "Give you some money?" He goes, "Yeah, I gave you that fifteen thousand. What fifteen thousand? And she told him, "I put it in your jacket." And he goes, "Oh." That's where that came from and stuff. And he goes, yeah, I don't have any money. Come to find out, he took that 15000 and bought a, bought himself a mobile home, you know, because it was only like 9000 for one. And then he bought himself a truck. And then he put some parts on his bike because he figured nobody came and claimed it. It was his money. Somehow it was his money. He didn't think he'd done anything wrong. I'll tell you what I love about your story uh, as well, Jamie, is, is, is uh, how proud you are of being from the Isle of Man. Yeah. You know, it's nice, even though you, you left there, but you're six months old. So when you went up there, then we went back for, I don't know, 64 years. Well, it was about, it was my, my first time back was, I didn't get back till 2019, so yeah, 64, about 64, 64 and a half years, yeah. yeah. No, David sent me the video. Yeah, we got some footage, footage yeah, and I watched it, and I went, oh, yeah. And someone asked Jamie if you can put it on at the end. Yeah. That's when you actually went back. Yeah, that was my yeah. first trip back, yeah. First trip back, and you can see yeah. the look on your face, how, yeah. how delighted you are, maybe you yeah. Even though you're only yeah. six months old, how, how proud are you? It's like a whole Your heritage, you know, heritage, you know yeah. like... Where you're from? Yeah, you're so proud of it. Well, you know, but the thing is, funny thing is, I've been back five times now, and every time I go, I go to different parts of the aisle yeah. and stuff, yeah, right? Of course, yeah. yeah. I've go to places I know there's no possible way I would have ever been before I left the aisle. Yeah. And yet they feel familiar. Yeah. Yeah. And every time I go over, I feel more like I belong there. Yeah. And I. People say whatever, superstitious or whatever. But I think it was something to do with what Martha said about her binding me to the aisle with her little gypsy thing. Yeah, you yeah, that she, that wrong with you all yeah, the time, didn't you? Because she kept telling me, you know, I did this for you so you'd be bound to the island. It will call you home. Mm -hmm. And like I said, when I got off that plane, uh, you did, he, he edited the part out. But there was a part where he had me stop at the top of the steps before I come down. Mm -hmm. And I breathed in the air and it was a cold breeze. And I breathed it in and it got warm. And I felt like an embrace. I, I honestly, and the thing is, almost every time I've gone back, even if rain was predicted, we've had sunny days when I was over there. Yeah, yeah. It just, but I mean, I, like we were, while we were there, I got up and I walked out because we were staying in a place right on the promenade and I walked down to the beach. And as I'm walking, the waves were going out. And I come to this thing when there was a little divot in the sand. And there was a little fish in the divot. I took my hat off and I scooped the fish up and carried it out and put it back in the waves. Yeah. You know, and and I just felt like yeah. that's, you know, the right thing to do. And I know there are people who probably wouldn't even think about that. But yeah. to me, you know, and, and like I said, but everywhere, I, you know, like I said, it's just one of these things where if, if I ever, 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 ever possibly could move back there, I would like to. Yeah. But the thing is, the thing is that I don't think I'll ever be financially able yeah. to. Yeah. But I still plan to go back a couple times a year. Yeah. And and yeah. and like I said, my lady will go with me. She enjoys it. She finds it just a a, a beautiful place. Beautiful. You know. But uh, at the same time, her family's all from Newcastle, and I wouldn't want to. Make her yeah. have to go someplace. Yeah. Not that she wouldn't go, but the idea that it'd be hard for her with because we watch the grandkids sometimes, and yeah. we go over and watch one of the family members' dogs, and then they'll watch our puppies when we're gone, and things like that. And I've built uh, flower planters for one of the families, and I've helped put a fence for another one. You know, and, and I and I do because I'm uh, even though they say I don't have any skills on paper, I have a lot of skills. Of course, that yeah, I, of course, yeah. You know, and and so like I said, 
Uh, and then when they, uh, you know, the fact that I'm up there and I can drive, I, I give, you know, when they, there's extra vehicle needed to be picked up people or take people, so I'm there. You know what amazes me about you? Huh? The time you've done in jail. Yeah. And how positive you actually are. Yeah, it is. It's how brilliant. <clears throat> yeah. Like about your future, about your positive, you know what's happened in the past. Yeah. You, you know, bad things have happened here, bad things. Yeah. And you're still... You're a positive man. Yeah. Well, I told people, I said, my thing was, I couldn't let the bastards win. To yeah. me, that's just winning. Yeah. And and if you re, if you know, you know song, the song San Quentin. Yeah. May your walls fall and may I live to tell. In my mind, that was what I was working for. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wear you. I will last and you will crumble to the sea and I will still make it. Yeah. And, and like I said, but from the moment I went into the prison, I kept believing that I would not only get out, but one day I'd get back over here. And hopefully one day get over to the aisle. Not sure yeah. if it was going to happen, but it did. And like I said, and, uh, but no, like I said, I, people have asked, why aren't you angry? Why aren't you, you know, depressed? Why? And I said, it doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do anybody else any good. And quite honestly, I enjoy talking to people and leaving them with a smile and, and happy thought you about, know, you, you know, know, what you need to do. Huh? You know, it's a millionaire if you can do it. You need to bottle what you've got and sell it. Because <laughs> it would sell all for me. Yeah, yeah. I'd certainly buy it. Honest yeah. to God, mate. But it's, 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 it's yeah. fantastic. And it, it's just the way you are yeah. at the end of it. Yeah. Well, so we're not at the end of it yet, are we? No. We're nowhere near <laughs> the end of it yet. So yeah. it's like. Yeah. And it goes on and on. Yeah, the never ending story. Yeah, the positive, the positivity yeah. out here, if you could bottle out and sell it, you would be a millionaire, mate. Yeah. You'd be a millionaire. Because I would buy it straight yeah. away. Because you're such a positive, nice person. There's something inside you as well. Isn't yeah. That? Well, that's why, like I said, that's why I felt that if, that if I had a chance to talk to the to kids, that I could possibly I be of help to them. And, yeah. and, 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 and I've wanted to, you know. I tried to but, do it when I got out of jail 20 odd years ago. Yeah. They wouldn't, it, it was like, I, wanted, I really wanted to help, and, and people wouldn't listen. Yeah. Probation wouldn't listen, you know. I just, well, I tried to talk at colleges when I first got over here because I told them, I, I actually contacted a few colleges, King's Colleges or one, but I contacted them. I said, look, I got 34 years in prison. I said, I can talk to your psychology classes and talk to them about the psychology of incarceration. I can talk to your sociology classes and talk about society in, in, in prisons and stuff. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, <laughs> I can talk to your law classes about the legal system. I say, you can talk to your classes on guys who are going into law enforcement and talk to them. Because I said, I'm not one of the guys who says, oh, all cops are bad. Yeah. No. But sometimes... They don't realize they don't have to be this way yeah. to do things. You don't have to come on and just be, you know, hard ass all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, there are times when you need to. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can talk to somebody and give the right tone and you're going to get so much more out of it. Exactly. And, uh, and, and like I said, and I thought for sure, and I told these people, look, I'm not even trying to get you guys to pay me. I just want to share. I got 34 years of experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to share what I have because if you're starting a career in law or science or sociology or psychology, I can give you something you can't get prior. And it's like when I, I, I tried to do crime con last year or two, what, two years ago, whenever, and they were going to have me on. And then some people started saying, oh, well, you know, he shouldn't be on because he's a convicted felon, blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and stuff. And, and yet they get the people on that, you know, our forensic people are talking about, oh, this serial killer. I said, yeah, but, you know, I broke bread with these people. I sat and talked to these people. You know what they told you they wanted you to hear if yeah. you spoke to them at all. Yeah. Normally you read a report about them and now you wrote a book about them. Yeah. But I know the guys. Yeah, you've actually been there. You've been there. I mean, I, when I was on the R.V. Herbie Mullen. He used to run our little, in, we, he was one of the guys who worked in the little, in the prison radio station for us. You had got headphones, you plug it, and they would change stations or so on. But I would come in on the yard one night. It was like just before 10 o'clock when they'd lock us up at that place. And Herbie goes, come here, come here. You got to hear this. And he hands me his headphones, they're big headphones. And I put them on. Listening. Listening. I look down and I see he's got the plug in his hand. Right? And I go, Herbie, what am I listening for? The sounds of the universe, man. Man. 
Can you even imagine it? <laughs> well, Herbie, um, no. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. But he made the comment where he says, oh, when I get out, he tells me, when I get out, I'm going to go on a world trip. I'm going to go and visit all these countries. And he goes, I think I'm going to go to the Isle of Man. I said, you don't want to go to the Isle of Man. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, I said, there, I said there's nothing there. I said, it, it's being turned into a wildlife sanctuary. There's no, nobody there. Oh, that's messed up. I said, what you got to do is go to China. I said, there's lots of places in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the way this podcast remains, but it has been. It has been <laughs> really, I've really enjoyed it. Well, that's why it was so funny because when I was do, going to do Paul Stansby, he go, he was talking originally to Sean about yeah, we'll we'll do we'll get a quick hour out of it. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how long we've gone there, but uh, it's a few hours. I think it's quite a few hours. But honestly, Jamie from himself, Porsche, yeah. Mitch, Fraser, you know, yeah. It's been absolutely Oh no, this has been this has been this has been great. Yeah. Only the beginning for all of us. You know, yeah. Hopefully. You hopefully, know, yeah. Let's let's have you back at a later date. Well that you know, certainly we'll I would back. more than willing to come back. But what I'd like to do as well, like you say we mentioned earlier on, is the the video Jamie's very kindly allowed us to use, um, is when he first goes back to the Isle of Man and we will leave his at the end of the podcast yeah. with that video. But we do have a few things we want to mention ourselves, don't we? There's a guy who follows our page. Uh, it's a little shout out from Phil Overton. Phil Overton, yeah, Phil. He's a he's a guy from Newcastle, where and he's he's going yeah. through the mill a bit, isn't he's, he? Yeah, he's 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 been told he's got to lose a leg. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't know the guy personally, but he, he's like he follows us. He's, he's a been subscriber, talking, yeah. and we chat with him, and you know, we just say like they say, we're there for you, mate. If you need us, you know, I don't know what yeah. we can do, Phil, but. but uh, uh, you know, you will. I tell you what, we'll do. We'll try and sort someone out. Get you out with the beat of it. Yeah, right? yeah. Like you see, you stay positive. He touches yeah. us. He's always smiling. But stay at him, mate. Yeah. We're showing for you. Yeah. Well, try and get a bit yeah. of a, all, all, a all the best. Try and get a butler. <coughs> <laughs> Jamie's off. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Take care, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Jamie, honestly. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. Yeah, we've really oh, enjoyed yeah. your company. It's been a brilliant. No, this has been great. This really yeah. has been great. Yeah. But uh, we wish you all a better look in the future. Oh. Yeah, we do. We keep an eye for yeah, us. Yeah, well, well, like I said, you know. Books, yeah. Like. Well, like I said, yeah, and like I said, um, you know, I brought some extra flyers in my bag. Yeah. That yeah. If you look in, if you look in the the uh, behind the granite wall one. Maybe. You know, and behind the granite wall, there's inside. There's a flyer. That's the card. No, yes. Yeah. Here, me the book. I'll show you. I put it. I put flyer no, you missed it. It's in the very beginning. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. So I've got these flyers, right. and they talk about both my books because oh, right. my cards I did before because I hand my cards what I hand out to people and I just talked them on the yeah. street. Right. But and then uh, like I said, in the bottom, hold your mud was a term that my gunny told us that you know basically it's the thing where my legs are wherever you were thrown, you stand. Yeah. Well, yeah. his thing was. You know, Marines are never on solid ground. We're in the mud all the time. So hold your mud. So yeah. where you are, you hold that spot, yeah. and then move forward a little bit. Move forward a little bit. Uh, but yeah, so I've got I've got a number of those. I was going to leave with you if you yeah, might no want to hand them to other people yeah, and no stuff. Problem. Yeah, we'll we'll we'll, yeah. we'll, 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 <clears throat> we'll you can. Yeah. We're going to put a link to that on the end of yeah. it. Yeah. At the end, uh, so you can actually get on your website. Yeah, uh, and I also have, I can YouTube be found on Facebook. Channel. Yeah, you've got Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, I'm, Facebook. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, yeah. Facebook, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, that is my, uh, my uh, basically there's a, you, my YouTube thing, but yeah. the the guy who does my, who does my video, and he, he, he monitors my, Right. My link there because I don't. I'm. I'm just not. Be, I'm too far behind the times. It's yes, some, it. Like I said, I, I'm having trouble with the TV yeah, remotes right now because we got a we got a Fire Stick and and uh, and, a so, and, all thing. That, and, and and I don't know which remote to use half the time right now. <laughs> the remote remote I have upstairs in the bedroom. Uh, I got the TV to come on, but I can't change the volume and I can't turn it off. Yes. So I've got to wait till yeah. uh, I get somebody to help me. <laughs> I mean, it's, I know it's, it's, so, it's so silly because like I said, I told people, I said, you know, in, 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 in prison we had the one where you go click, click, yeah. click, yeah. you know, Seriously. or like one of the guys when they first got the ones where you had buttons on them, I made, yeah. I made a back scratcher and a yeah, stick so he could do it. Yeah. So he had a remote, he had a remote card and stick and he actually contacted, he's out. And he says, he saw my thing, he goes, you may not remember me, but we were selling. He said, when I had my TV and I was too damn lazy to lean way 
to the other end of the bed to do it. You made me the, the remote control stick and the back scratcher combination. You know, and stuff. And he goes, I still got it. He goes, I, I brought it home with me and stuff. So, yeah, you know, but yeah. So. Oh, that's been fantastic. It's been fantastic, man. Legacy, I've seen you so much. Oh, no, I, I can't, I can't thank you guys enough. Yeah. You've been so hospitable yeah. to yeah. me. Thank I appreciate you, it. Man, yeah. But uh, like you say, guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, Thanks, guys. If you enjoy the videos, get some comments, hit them thumbs up, and please subscribe. Please subscribe. We need subscriptions, guys. We're doing this with our own cash, our own time. You know, it's costing us. We, you know, if we can get a little bit of something back, we need we need to go further afield, guys. We need to be travelling. Yeah, yeah. So please subscribe. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, guys. So once again, we'll leave with a video of Jamie Morgan Kane on his first trip back to the Isle of Man after being from six months old to 64 years later. There you go. See you later, guys. Thank See you. Guys. Thank you. Keep your belief.